since the beginning of this hiking cycle, we've tried to say a soft landing is the most likely outcome. We're clearly nowhere near where the Fed wants us to be on inflation, but momentum is easing. The Fed is looking for an excuse not to hike. The Fed has already signaled that they plan to cut rates by 100 basis points next year. I think we've closed the door to a September Fed hike. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Wrapping up the month of August, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with Katie Lines. There is only one reason I've turned up for work today. Got that it's right. It's for this guy. 7.45 Eastern Time, Max Verstappen. F1 champion, Red Bull racing, one of the best to ever do right. it. TK, that interview just around the corner. This is a real pleasure for us. This is really your Simon, thank you for just getting this done uh, for Team Formula One. And what's so important here is Mr. Villeneuve over at Autosports comes out and says, Mr. Verstappen wants Sir Lewis is his next teammate. That is published by Autosport is that a fact? this morning. We're not doing equities, bonds, currencies, and commodities <laughs> today. We're doing Formula One. Monza with John Farrell. Nine consecutive race wins. Can he make it 10 in Monza, Italy at the Temple of Speed this weekend? I can't wait for this, TK. I've got no idea what's going on in markets. <laughs> Don't know what the data looks like in Europe or stateside. This is why I'm here this morning. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, we've had just so much fun with this and with English Premier League and such, a little bit of baseball and the rest. But this guy, John, is bigger than the sport. He's just so it's, dominant it's, right now. Like maybe Tom Brady for a window of a couple of years, but even more than that. I mean, it's just absolutely unique. So that's coming up we'll a little bit later. It. We do have to talk about the data as well. Yeah, we do. Somewhat read in. So let's get you up to speed on some of that. So yesterday we had more economic data in America, a softer ADP print, encouraging some of the equity market balls to go a step further. Four day winning streak on the S&P. Then this morning, Europe in a completely different situation. Katie Lines, yep. CPI, Europe, we have a problem. Yeah, stop slowing in August. 5.3% the headline year on year figure and even core came in in line sure 6.4 percent that is well above the ecb's target of two percent yet you see a weaker euro on the back of this today john 108.75 where we are right now because isabel schnabel is talking about the growth risk if europe is facing stagflation does the ecb choose to fight the inflation side or support support the growth side as they're looking ahead to the meeting next month the core of this ecb completely non-committal tom going into September 14th. Not just Isabel <clears throat> Schnabel, someone who I have a great amount of respect for, fantastic communicator on the executive board of the ECB, but also President Lagarde in your conversation, Tom, going into last weekend. Yeah, they're going to keep their optionality open, and it's not only the optionality to September 14th, but it's really into the end of the year. And to the point of stagflation there, there's, you know what he talks about American sclerosis, but they're talking and thinking and in the back of their mind about eurosclerosis. And the key thing for me is have they escaped double digit unemployment it's pretty optimistic on that Kelsey but Barrow the new Europe the new Europe what's it look like JP Morgan's Kelsey Barrow yeah. stagflation that word yesterday Tom yeah. you wonder if that gets used more and more and I wonder if that comes up at the news conference in Frankfurt Germany in a couple of weeks time and how the ECB president Christine Lagarde Tom oh. would bat that one away Quickly, equity markets, where are the bears? End of August. August was terrible. <laughs> Terry, give me the drawdown banner if you would. On radio, it's real simple. This is the math from the 2021 high. John, down 6% from the 2021 high. Dow down 7%. NASDAQ, which usually really lags in a tough market, down 6% as well. This month, we're down 1.6% on yeah. the S&P 500. Yeah. Had five months Go of gains on the S&P 500. <laughs> Biggest month of losses, first month of losses since February, potentially, at the close a little bit later. Let's get to the price action. Equity slightly elevated, up by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Yields coming in, tons of data a little bit later. We're down two basis points on a 10-year here, Kaylee, at 4.0964%. Yeah, and of course, looking at the euro there again, the 108 level, we're going to get potentially more clues on what's happening in the eurozone. And inside the thinking of the ECB, at 7.30 a.m. Eastern time when we get the account of the July 27th meeting. Will we get clues on what could happen at the September 14th meeting since to your point Sean the ECB has been very reluctant to pre-commit either way but how are they thinking about the growth side relative to the inflation side of the equation then at 8 30 a.m eastern time more economic data here stateside jobless claims 
weekly, of course, as well as personal income and spending and the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, the PCE deflator. Both headline and core expected to come in at a little bit more subdued, uh, two tenths of a percent in July. Then finally, after the bell, earnings season still isn't over. We're almost at the end, uh, but we still have a few names left to go. Broadcom will be reporting, and this one is going to be a read through onto just how much it is benefiting from the AI buzz that none of us seem able to get away from, John. Kelly, thanks for the update. Busy day ahead going into the weekend. John Stolfus, Chief Investment Strategist at Oppenheimer Asset Management, joins us now. John, wonderful to have a bull on the programme. Let's talk about why you're still so bullish and reflect on the economic data of the week, sir, if we can. There is a feeling that bad news is somewhat good news. Is there a tipping point when bad news just becomes, John, bad news? Well, uh, uh, thanks for having me on the show, uh, uh, John. It's always great to be on surveillance. Uh, I've got to say, you know, when we look at it, uh, things are continue to get better uh, offsetting negativity. That's why uh, bad news has been good news. In essence, we're seeing the economy is genuinely slowing some, but it's not falling off the cliff, whether it's the consumer, whether it's jobs, uh, whether it's it's uh, our Q2 earnings, even though you had a drop in earnings for the S&P 500. Last I, I looked at my Bloomberg a few minutes ago, what, negative 6% uh, on the quarter. <clears throat> It's uh, three sectors have the negative uh, earnings growth. They're double digit, and it's it's energy, materials, and healthcare. It's not tech or consumer discretionary or industrial. Uh, so, John, you've been one of the great bulls. You've been one of the great great bulls. Where are you right now, Ford? Four thousand what? 4900 for the end of the year remains our target. Uh, we did uh, lower our our uh, a projection of what earnings will look like for this year from two thirty down to two twenty. Uh, but overall, we're right. looking for support to uh, the S&P 500 to remain uh, remarkably strong. What, what do you need to do to get to 5,000? I mean, I got to make some news here today. What do you need to do to up that to 5,000? Uh, Tom, you're egging me on. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think I think we need to to, to to have some remarkable news related to uh, the Fed's achievements uh, against inflation and a real clear signal. Uh, that it's the end of the cycle with a pause, not because the economy is falling apart, but rather that it has achieved its goal. I don't think that happens this year. I think that happens in 2024. Well, and in 2024 is when this market increasingly and earlier is expecting the Fed to start cutting rates. So if we do get to 4,900 or potentially even 5,000, John, can we stay up there if the reason they're cutting is because things have turned south and the tightening has taken perhaps more effect uh, than they would have wanted to if they overshoot? Well, I, I think the key word there, uh, the operative word is if things have turned south, it's if things have basically gone so that we really are, are entering a period of sustainable economic growth at a, at, a, uh, at, a, at a slow or moderate pace. I don't think that uh, uh, we'll be seeing the, the, the Fed cut drastically. Mm. And th this might be one of those, uh, just because uh, when we look at it, the inflation was caused by overstimulation in fiscal policy is what we look at, or we, we think, of two administrations. And they, they did that. They were concerned about the effects of COVID on the economy. And, and likely all that stimulation is what is enabling us to get through this period of a Fed funds hike cycle as well as we are. So we, we think at this point, uh, we think this is it continues to be a workout market. And a workout market is always uh, has considerable uncertainty to it in terms of its outcome. But we wouldn't bet against the American consumer and we wouldn't bet against American business, the American economy. We, we think we're, uh, we're, we're the sunlight is at the end of the tunnel, not an oncoming locomotive. Well, John, let's hope that's the case. I think a lot of people feel the same way. You said the consumer. Don't bet against the American consumer. Plenty of retailers have flagged up plenty of issues <clears throat> over the last couple of weeks. What do you read into that? Most certainly. And yet consumer discretionary as a sector is, is doing very well. I think it reflects the services end of the economy versus uh, uh, the goods. A lot of that is, is is related to at this period in the cycle. It's still the experiential adventure for the consumer in many ways. Yeah. Uh, the consumer has slowed. And then the if you look at the individual retailers, it really has to do with who, who is balancing e-commerce and bricks and mortar or e-commerce and some kind of touch with their consumer and, and meeting the consumer's right. needs. And so, you know, that's the way to look at it. John, what do you do with big tech? I mean, let's say I own shares. I got a big gain. I mean, do you have a, a rationalization of owning those big seven stocks 
where you just take a terminal value out three years, five years, hold your nose and say, let's go? I, I think, you know, it, it, it's not quite hold, hold your nose. It, it's take a look and look at the companies and consider what businesses they have that are deeply embedded in the lives of both the consumer as well as in business. And amongst those big seven, it, it's a fairly recurring uh, trend that you see or a trend that, that keeps rolling forward in an upward direction. Uh, they yeah. remain companies that are very deeply embedded in our lives, both as consumers and as business people. And so revenue growth is likely to continue. It'll ebb and flow uh, at, at different points. And, you know, it, it's trees don't grow to the sky and all. But the general trend looks like uh, this is parallel to where the automobile was in the early 20th century after uh, Ford uh, had, uh, you know, uh, essentially improved the 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 uh, the, the uh, the manufacturing uh, uh, process to increase pro uh, increase the ability of the automobile in terms of quality and lower the price. Uh, technology easily accessible uh, that makes it deeply embedded in our lives and it's profitable. So, John, what role does that small group of stocks play in the 400 point gap between where we are now and where you think we're going to get in 4900, considering that they have been the biggest point contributors to the gains we have seen this year? Can they continue to provide that leadership? Well, you know, I, I think in, in, in essence, when we look at it, it it's you, you've got to realize that technology is not unto itself. Uh, rather, it contributes to all 11 sectors. So within the 11 sectors, I mean, we own some uh, industrial stocks. I can't mention the names. The firm doesn't allow me to, to pitch what Thank I own. Thank God for that. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but we own uh, stocks in the industrial sector, uh, in consumer discretionary, uh, and, and uh, uh, within, within the space of other sectors that have done remarkably well. Uh, and it just has to do with uh, it, it, it's, it's a combination of alpha generation as well as, as play in the broader sectors. John, I get you can't do single names, but can you just describe in greater detail what's within consumer discretionary, given that it's such a broad space? Yeah, within consumer discretionary, you know, it, it has to do again with leisure stocks. It has to do with uh, uh, stocks related uh, to uh, uh, gaming, uh, to travel, it has to do with uh, uh, the the electrification of the automobile and the process of that transition uh, that's reflected within all kinds of products that are sold in stores. Uh, and it, it also has to do, there's, there's a certain element here coming up where there is a back to the office trend that is not back to the office like we used to be, but certainly uh, where people are coming out of the caves uh, going back to uh, uh, going back to 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 a more uh, uh, normalized uh, environment where they show up at the office three days a week. Hey, John, good to hear from you as always. John Stolfus there of Oppenheimer. How about this from Morgan Stanley? My favourite quote of the week: "Calling the end of the Barbenheimer bounce." <laughs> this is what they've got to say: Real consumer spending is tracking 1.9 percent quarter on quarter annualised growth <clears throat> in three Q23. We estimate Barbenheimer. Taylor Swift's The Era's Tour and Beyonce's Renaissance Tour are combined contributing 0.7 percentage points to consumption growth, Tom, this quarter, and that yeah. ultimately after 3Q, it will fade. It will fade from here. Okay, it'll fade from there. I get it. It's the summer season and all that. I mean, you know, it, it's absolutely insane, John, what people are doing. Like, they're traveling to Europe to see bands. They can see the damn band in <laughs> Philadelphia or whatever. They can go to Chicago. It's, it's too expensive. Instead, they get on an airplane. Yeah, and you've made I, this I've point about the Formula One. You go to Latin America, right? Yeah. Something, Argentina? Something like that? Yeah. Okay. Basically anywhere that's not. Yeah, you know, you, you go to Copenhagen, you go to Dublin, and you see the band you're going to see in New York, except it's cheaper to go to Dublin than it is... I don't know if it's cheaper to see Taylor in Dublin than here. I've but got no idea, but in some places it's cheaper to get a flight there and yeah. watch it abroad than it is to buy a ticket. I, I, I figured out the scam today. This is a scam. Afterthought is in the studios today, and I just figured out, John, the Apple Store is 642 steps away and open 24-7. It says the Barbie AirPods Max, $549. Oh, I'm sorry, what? $549. $549. They're like pink headphones. Just for pink headphones. They say afterthought, you know. Wow. Yeah. 
we'll have around uh, 3,000 jobs that will be uh, made uh, redundant uh, over the next uh, years. Uh, 1,000 are in relation to our decision to integrate the Swiss bank. If we would have chosen to spin off the Swiss bank, we would have had to reduce it by 600. So the delta is 400 people. Sergio Adamotti, UBS CEO, putting a number on it, a number that we haven't heard before. Speaking of Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua, over the last 24 hours, Tom, 3,000. Does that sound like a large number to you, TK, no, given that the Credit Suisse increased UBS's workforce by 45 Thousand. The typical rule, the rule of thumb, CFA rule of thumb is you get a three-year workout on any takeover. They don't have the luxury of three years. they got massive politics there. So are they going to pop a 10,000 number, which is bigger than 9,999? No, they're going to come in short. And the language you use is going to tranche it out. You're going to see 3,000 now, a little bit of drift away here. You're going to see another 500, another 1,000, maybe another 3,000. Two, three years out, they're going to take their time doing it because it gives them political cover. They had decent numbers this morning. That stock <clears> is up by a little more than 5%. The broader equity market, S&P 500 futures here, positive as well by 0.1% on a four-day winning streak on the S&P 500, looking to make it five, the longest winning streak so far since the middle of July, and trimming the losses of August down to 1.6%, <clears> potentially, most likely, the first monthly loss going back to February term on the s and I'm going to go to the, the VIX, 13.91. I know that people are going to say, the sophisticates, sophisticates are going to say, you know, there's some volatility things here and things I don't understand. You know what? The VIX is 13.91. It was 31 uh, in October, uh, the bear market. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, it's simple math. We've gone from 31 to 13, John. We should be standing up on the table screaming celebration bull market. I don't feel that out there. Just saw a headline, Tom, I want to share with you just quickly. China seeking to boost consumption through personal income tax breaks. How many headlines like this have we seen from China? They're all tweaks. Just one after another the, the, at you know, the moment. But there's another one, Tom, just to keep an eye on <clears throat> yeah, I, from policymakers I, I, over in China. In this case, it's to the consumer, to the people of China. And that's great. I'm most interested in what they do with the state-owned em- enterprises, which have come back strong under President Xi. When are we going to see big things on debt work out of troubled SOEs, they're called? And, you know, that'll be interesting. See, see little tweaks here and there, but the fiscal push, Tom. All right. It's the big one we've been waiting for. And that's just a little bit of a hint at that, that maybe we're leaning further in that direction. You know, you know, what do they do with Chico? I mean, we've we got Max Verstappen coming up. Oh, you I want to talk Formula One, we're not doing China. I can't clearly. concentrate. Okay. <laughs> it's new about it, it, Villanova, over, it. What is new Villanova about this? over at Autosport <laughs> says that, that Max wants Sir Lewis to be his partner. But then what do they do with Chico? You know, Checo. Sergio. Checo. 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 Whatever. I'm Sergio. Checo. He's killing it. I like Sergio. You know, Jacques Villeneuve is not a journalist. Are you aware of that? Huh? Yeah. He's a former driver. I don't care. You know, I don't. It's, come on. I'm trying to make. You know, folks, the way this works is Farrell runs the interview, and I've got one question that our, our advisors have brought in to okay. talk to Max. One hour, 20 minutes away, Tom. Keep it together. We'll see that. Max Verstappen with us later uh, today. Someone as esoteric and wonderful as Max Verstappen. Jean-Patrick Barnard is in Frankfurt here, and he knows Swiss banking. He's worked within the banking racket and provides journalistic services to Bloomberg News. <laughs> Were you surprised by these announcements, John? I mean, come on. You buy the bank. It's a shotgun marriage. You know how that's funny accounting and all that. Am I supposed to be surprised at a $29 billion statistic? No, absolutely not. That's accounting shenanigan. And, and we all know that that uh, they bought Credit Suisse on the cheap when it comes to the pure yeah. purchase price. And there are a lot of risks that are associated with the, the deal. So the 29 billion number is not, not very surprising. But what you can be surprised about a little bit, or at least I was, and I feel like some market participants as well, is like how firm the management of uh, UBS already is in their idea and their vision on how they want the merger to play out. That is very unusual. As you said, it was a shotgun marriage. It was just barely six months ago. Uh, and I feel like they're giving us really like good content and good ideas on how they want to shape up this merger, where they want the bank to position. And and that's a very surprising thing to me that they're able to do this. When you're popping a 20 euro bowl of soup in Brasserie Lip, you people are gossiping about who from Credit Suisse survived. Did many people from Credit Suisse survive? 
Well, for the for the time being, that is still the case. I mean, we heard that they are cutting 3,000 jobs in in Switzerland, and uh, as you mentioned before, that's probably not the end of the um, uh, of the uh, of the number here, and we will get something much much higher. And they will like feed this to the market and to the politicians, to the general public, especially uh, step by step, not to lose their um, the cover for the merger or to create any any storm that they don't want. On the other hand, I also feel like uh, while they're giving us a good idea on where they want the bank to be in position and how they want to move forward, is that they have haven't figured out all the details. And we heard the CEO today that's saying he is surprised by um, how many um, good uh, uh, additional business credit Swiss is bringing in that, uh, that is fitting uh, into, into the overall picture. So I think like they have not fully figured out like where do we want to keep the talent and where do we have like the real overlap that we need to get rid of. So there's clearly still work left to be done. What timeline realistically are we looking at? How much longer is this going to take? Uh, well, it, it's still going to take years. That's that's for sure. But uh, again, UBS is doing the right thing here in in terms of that they are giving us like step by step, and on every meeting that they are speaking, they are giving us something um, to deal with and to see like in in which direction the bank is is heading. Um, the whole merger until we get like the final picture is probably still going to be next year or even like 2025 uh, until they have figured everything out. Um, but they promise they give us more details uh, on the fourth quarter earnings, which will be somewhere in in January or February of of next year. So that's the next mile stone to watch. And at the end of the analyst call, Sergio Amorti, the CEO, also said like, there's plenty of time to speak to each other in case there are any questions until the third quarter uh, earnings. So again, they understand that the market is desperate for information and wants to see like every new development, what they're doing. And they have understood this. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they will, if they have good news, um, they will mm -hmm. feed this to us step by step and as early as possible. If they have good news, where are the potential opportunities for bad news? What are the biggest risks here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there are plenty. And uh, it was funny, again, the CEO saying on the call that they are, are not naive and they are not like painting a blue sky scenario here. Mm -hmm. um, there are obstacles along the way. Uh, one is like with the risk weighted assets that they have now outsourced into uh, the so-called non-core and legacy unit. That's $55 billion. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, stuff that can potentially blow up. They said it won't, but you never know. The other thing is like they still don't know how the clients will behave. It's looking pretty solid right now in terms of uh, clients coming back to the combined lender um, but we need like uh, at least like two or three more quarters to see if like if this trend is, is sustained uh, and also like they were very short on details on telling us like, um, like how do you want to win back the clients how do you want to align your your mm -hmm. business in details in certain areas of course it's a bit much to ask again just six months since the merger was announced but a little bit more details here um, uh, would be helpful and there are still like some areas where they could surprise now that they're one Who's their arch competitor? I mean, obviously, I'm going to say Deutsche Bank, but inform me. Who are they competing against? Other Swiss banks I don't know? Or Deutsche Bank? Or JP Morgan? Who's UBS competing against? Well, that, that's a very good question. I mean, like they have nobody like on the same level here in Europe. But of course, you have a lot of niche players or smaller wealth management players who will try to get a share and who will try to benefit of that um, client behavior where clients are certainly not going to have like a con concentration risk uh, from their assets at Credit Suisse and UBS. So I guess like everybody will, will try to, to, to get a, a big cake here. But um, I was just like thinking about this for a, for a broader story. Like every European bank maybe want to watch this merger very closely because you suddenly see, even though it was four, First, it somehow seems to work and you have now a major major bank here with like five trillion dollars of uh, of assets under management uh, and uh, you need to compete against them so the question is like for all the other big players out there do you want to consider a merger maybe as well to get to the same scale um, because otherwise competing against UBS in terms of wealth management at least seems to be a very hard and upward battle I would say. Jan isn't this unique though didn't they get a dance partner essentially for free? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, you could come to that conclusion, I would say, of course, I mean, the price was very cheap. But again, like there are still risks associated with this merger. It's not a done deal yet. It's looking pretty well for the time being. But again, you could see like the, the final quarter results that we had from Credit Suisse today had a $10 billion loss in it. Uh, sorry, 10 billion um, Swiss francs loss in it. So there's still like a huge burden that they now have on the balance sheet. Again, there are five fifty five billion dollars in this non-core unit that they need to run down. Um, and again, they still don't know how clients will behave so uh, it's looking good right now they're doing the right things but this is not in 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 dry papers now and uh, there could still be go something wrong so i would say like telling them this was for free and of course this is going well is is too short well said
Jan Patrick, thank you, sir. Jan Patrick Barner of Bloomberg on UBS. The stock is higher this morning by about 5%. Gilles Moak of AXA Investment Managers coming up. The ECB stuck between a rock and a hard place. Growth ain't good. Inflation is a problem. From New York, good morning. Four-day winning streak on the S&P 500, attempting to make it day five. Equities right now positive by 0.1%. So far, so good if you came into this week looking for a softening in labour market data. Job openings a whole lot lower. Tom, we had the quits rate down. <coughs> Jobless claims a little bit later. Let's see what that looks like. But yesterday, a downside surprise on the ADP report going into payrolls on Friday. You know, I don't follow the pilot, pilot game, but essentially the rate rise sweat has completely gone away back to three times ago Powell spoke or whatever. I mean, we've just given up the rate rise. And I, I love to talk to Andrew Hollenhorst now about how he reframes after the last five, six days of data. Guess who's coming up a little bit later? I know. Sid is Andrew Hollenhorst. Who's bigger, <laughs> Verstappen or Hollenhorst? It's, Hollenhorst, you know, without a doubt. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. <laughs> no-brainer, TK. Let's turn to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. I want to sit on the two-year. Just think about the range we've had this week. The higher the week, 5.1%. Lower the week, 483. Right now, 486.70 yields down a couple of basis points. Tom, to your point, yeah. the stress brought about from high yields, the worries around that story in the bond market Fine. fading over the last week. I'd say more than fading because you got a persistency, you got an, inert an inertial force to four days. In, for example, the 10 year real yield, what I'm really focused on, Ian Lingen was brilliant on it yesterday. Call it a 2.02. .02 down to 1.84. That's a ginormous percentage move there on the inflation-adjusted yield. The nominal yield, 4.1% <coughs> on a 10-year right now. Two Tuesdays ago, 436. I did not know that. Intraday, 436. So we're down 26 basis points from that high. Down a single basis point this morning. If you turn to the FX market, the euro just, well, stuck between a rock and a hard place for the ECB going into next week. We've got some weakness here on the euro after some strength yesterday. Euro dollar breaking down here by 0.5%. 108 69. Yeah. I would say for American audience, we're going to do this now under surveillance and then Jill Moet coming up. And this is important for the American audience to see how Europe struggles with this relative to what we're struggling with in Washington. Let's get you all up to speed on the economic data. Under surveillance this morning, some hope for China's struggling economy. Manufacturing PMIs rising to 49.7, beating estimates and moving closer and closer to the 50 level that signals some expansion. Non-manufacturing easing more than estimates, though, suggesting the economy continues to be weighed down by the property downturn and subdued consumer spending. Kaylee and the Chinese authorities yeah. are still coming every single day with something new. Yeah, the latest today being a tax break on on child care and child's education spending, which in the statement from the Ministry of Finance literally says is conducive to improving residents' willingness and ability to consume. They are trying to stoke the fire, John. It just becomes a question of whether each piecemeal step they take is going to be enough to actually do so. Let's see what we get tomorrow. This is what we got this morning from the Eurozone. Inflation coming in hotter than expected, raising the prospect of the ECB hiking rates for a tenth consecutive time next month. Consumer prices rising 5.3% from a year earlier. The same figure as July, but higher than the economist estimates <coughs> of 5.1%. Tom, when you look at the data, you might say, OK, door is open for a hike on September 14th. I believe the door is open. Whether they walk through it, based on the communication we've had from ECB <laughs> officials, I see no commitment right now based on comms alone that they're going to move again in a couple of weeks. Again, I go to the real yield. This graphic on radio, it's really good from it's Spain, 2.1% out the Eurozone, 5.3%. And each country is so different. But the fact is the common feature is massively negative real yields. And that's starkly different than what we've got in America. It's, 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 it's an overall economy, John. It's not in the textbook. Brilliant guest coming up on this, so stay tuned for that. Jill Moak of AXA in just a moment. I want to finish with this. Residents in Florida assessing the damage in the wake of Hurricane Idalia as it weakens to a tropical storm and passes through the Carolinas. Reports of damaged buildings and flooding in Florida that could lead to a repair bill, Tom, of up to $20 billion. US dollars. That's quite a number. It's a big number. And as, as Rob Carolyn said yesterday, he was quite good on this, on the insurance part of it. He said at some point it ends and it just hasn't ended yet. We're still building on the coast. And this, of course, cuts up against a lot of wildlife territory, not like the drama of hitting Miami or Tampa uh, directly and head on. But I would just suggest it's early in the season. 
my my amateur take from a pro like Rob Carroll, and as we're going to see a lot more of this this year. Well, that's the point, Tom. The we're in the season; it's to be expected. But if the frequency, if it becomes more frequent frequency, yeah. and more severe, then it gets harder and harder to insure. And to your point, it becomes more and more difficult to build in these areas. I, I believe the governor of Florida had a tree fall around or on the governor's house. Didn't say that. Mr. DeSantis and Mrs. DeSantis had to make a comment. That's a frightening thing. I mean, you have a tree fall in your house, you know, that's, I've never had that. I've never experienced that. I haven't experienced that either. I'm not sure <laughs> no where this is going. No tree tall enough to reach Tom's apartment. Yeah. Well, it's a six floor walk up. So mm. it's a little, <laughs> okay. you're coming against a window. I get the feeling this is about someone in the control room who has had a tree fall in their house. It's frightening. It's like okay. serious stuff. And, you know, there's some serious stuff going on with Adelia. And, and, and frankly, I look at Franklin. I mean, Bermuda, if I was going to Bermuda this weekend, I'd be canceling the flight. I'd be just like, I would just would be like, okay. yeah, I'm down at Cambridge Beaches there, the little pink cottages mm. out on the west side, right. and hanging out. And you're like, no, you really you are know, determined like, to wind me up, aren't you? you no, know, you, <laughs> you, just, you just say no to Bermuda this weekend. Okay, like, let's share it, Tom. We might as well. <clears> I was we, going to Bermuda. I'm not going to Bermuda anymore. Okay, we've done that. Gonna yeah. wind me up anymore Turn about my Franklin. My vacation be, that never be, was. There'll be some. No, <laughs> excuse me. He's not going to Bermuda. Don't let anyone know. He's going to Monza. That'll be fun as well. Let's save ourselves. Jill Moak joins us right now, chief economist at Accent. After the fourth question to Lagarde, you go. What would Jill say? Jill, what is the question you would ask Christine Lagarde right now? Well, the question everyone has, has on his, his or her mind, which is, you know, uh, now that we know that monetary policy is being transmitted to, to the economy, can you afford to, to stop? And uh, the the issue that uh, the ECB has right now, and I guess this would be somewhat her, her response, is that, yes, we now know that monetary policy is, is working its way through the economy because the economy is not doing well. Uh, they can be reassured on that on that side, but for now there is no impact whatsoever on inflation, and this is this is the, the big issue we have. We have more slowdown than the U.S., but still with more inflation, and that's the conundrum for the ECB. Is it real economy rigidities, in unions and stuff like that? Or is it that there's no fiscal offset to a combined monetary policy? It, it might be due to rigidities, true, because uh, the impression we, we have is that in the U.S., the labor market reacts you know, faster, wage bargaining reacts faster, because in reality, uh, the negotiations are more on an, on an individual basis. If the market is doing really, really well, people will go to their employers and say, look, you know, I've got this opportunity, you need to, to raise my, my pay, and this is how you get to, to wage growth. And the minute the economy slows down even a little bit, wage growth also normally starts slowing down. It's not the way works in a lot of European countries where you still have some form of uh, 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 centralized uh, wage negotiation, at least at the level of, of each industry, so that you have you know, uh, a lag between the time the unions, for instance, get aware that the situation is getting worse, get aware that you know maybe employment is is now uh, in jeopardy, and accept to moderate uh, their, their wage claims. It takes longer. This is exactly the situation in which we are right now in Germany, for instance, which is one which is at the top, actually, of of, of inflation across countries at, at the moment in the in the eurozone because uh, you can see that the economy is not doing well at all. You know, Germany was in recession uh, at the end of last year, beginning of, of, of this year, uh, but people have not yet seen the impact truly on the labour market and wage negotiations remain very, very tense and we can still see wage growth exceeding whatever the ECB would probably want to, to tolerate. So we are in the sort of you know, lull, uh, waiting for you know, the, the labor market to, to catch cold so that we can actually, yes, stop uh, uh, this, this, this acceleration in wages. Well, acceleration in wages and also just more widely inflation, to your point about it not hitting inflation yet, yet the tightening clearly showing up in, in the economy. Is it just a matter of the tools not being fit for the job at this time it's just not working as well that transmission mechanism uh, no i don't think so i think that the the, the transmission of, of the monetary policy signal to the real economy works i would say pretty well a little too well i would say if you look at 
the speed at which our indicators are slowing down at, at the moment. Uh, we've had, for instance, credit, credit growth uh, slow down massively. Actually, it's negative in terms of, of credit impulse. Uh, you can see, for instance, that, that the flow of new loans to the household sector is now is now negative. So clearly, there is a collective response from uh, uh, households, from banks, also from the corporate sector to the fact that interest rates are higher. That works. What is still not working, or what at least is not showing up in the numbers, is the connection between the slowdown right. in economic activity and a slowdown in prices. Yeah, I guess that was more my question. It doesn't seem like it's working as much on the inflation front in particular, but how much of this is also just a product of energy, and especially in light of what we're seeing with LNG in Australia, some of the other concerns uh, out there about supply, is that something that has the potential to get worse going forward? Now, in some countries, infl inflation is still very much driven by, by energy. Uh, the bad figure we had in France, for instance, th this morning is, is driven primarily mm -hmm. by, by energy. We, we kind of knew that. Uh, but what is, and obviously we need to monitor this, because if we've got a harsh winter, for instance, uh, very different from what we had last year, then yes, you could have more pressure on energy prices and in another wave of, of inflation. That's definitely something to monitor. However, what is probably more problematic for the ECB is that core inflation, excluding food and energy, is not doing particularly well either. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had a deceleration. We lost 20 bips of core inflation in August. But actually, if you look at this over the last three to four months, basically, we're in a sort of channel slightly above 5%. It is not slowing down. So, yes, energy matters. But what is clearly making it really hard to, to deal with the situation is that it's core inflation, which continues to be to be to be too high. And that's a big difference with the US. In the US, we can see the core inflation yeah. and not just headline inflation is heading down. Jill, I don't know if you measure it easily, but in America, we have domestic final sales, which basically takes away the foreign component. If you take out the export import complex dynamics of Europe, do they have a com constructive domestic final sales or does it scream recession? Uh, I would need to do the calculation, but consumption is, is already slowing down quite significantly in a number of, a number of countries, including in countries where normally consumption you know, is really the engine of growth. For instance, again, you know, my country, France, uh, we've had you know, a good GDP in, in, in Q2. It was a bit of an accident. But if you look at consumer spending, it's basically been flat uh, since the, the end of last year. There is no you know, real uh, surprise there. I mean, real income has been, has been properly damaged by, by the inflation wave. Uh, wage growth is problematic, but it, it has not been as strong as it's been in the US. So real wages have taken a hit actually uh, six months ago. So no, domestic demand is, is not doing particularly well. And I would add that there might be another difference now between the US and the Eurozone, which is the impact on IRA on, on investment. I mean, that's for me, that's one of my biggest surprises when I look at the US right now is the resilience of investment. It might be due to the fact that some corporations are responding to the IRA. A, 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 a push. We don't really have something close to that in, in Europe. We have you know, a European package, but it's fairly slow and it has not yet made its way uh, through, uh, through the economy. So that might be another difference uh, across our two regions. What a difficult moment for the ECB going into next month. Jill, thank you for the update, sir. Appreciate it as always. Jill Moak there of AXA Investment Managers. September 14th for the ECB. A week or so after that, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve decision, relatively speaking, is so much more straightforward than yeah, the ECB. Absolutely. I've got no idea what the optimal policy response so, would be for President Lagarde and co. after the data of this week. I mean, I have a good export-import here, and Jean-Marc mentions his France. I mean, I'm thinking May 9th next year, Paris La Defense Arena, Taylor Swift. Is I mean, how many is? Americans are going to go to Paris? Could you imagine Kaylee flying over <laughs> to Paris to see Taylor at Paris La Defense? I, I, I could imagine. Are you going to make that happen? I hope so. You mean, I got Section First 401. First Blink-182. Section yeah. 401, <laughs> which is somewhere near Marseille. Uh, section or Lyon, excuse me, is $776 okay. per seat. That's like nothing compared to what people were yeah, paying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You go over there to get it cheaper. I saw ticket prices, Kaylee, is something like tens of thousands. Is that right? I think so. That's when ridiculous. the initial resale whole ticket master fiasco happened. Can you imagine yeah. spending that much money on a concert? Well, how about well, nine hundred twelve dollars Rockstar Section One out there? You know, I mean I'd be there. There's one seat for me. But what's the Paris difference too. between spending that on a concert and spending that to see Messi play? Oh, where'd you want me to begin? <laughs>
How did you want me to begin? But really, what's the impulse of American We're spending about in France? One of the France? greatest athletes oh, in the history go. of all sports. And Wait, come on, Max Verstappen's Not, coming up. How can you compare <laughs> Taylor You're Swift to like Ver- the Beatles? Okay, the Rolling Stones. Come on, Verstappen, Taylor, Messi. Stop it, <laughs> Verstappen, Messi. Help me. Max Verstappen, I'm an arrow away from there. New York. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. For us, the real story is still China. And I think people are underestimating China's desire to start selling their own goods, their own brands, and possibly denominated in yuan, mostly to emerging markets countries. And when we sit here and examine China today, they are clearly experiencing trouble. They are going to do some things to fix that. But I think it's going to have to be pushing their brands globally. Just absolutely love catching up with Peter Chia of Academy Securities. Academy Securities, Tom, packed full of veterans, generals who know a ton about what's going on right now <clears throat> in China. Always great to get Peter's perspective on the latest. Well, there were an Admiral field here on Annapolis and uh, at Naval field as well. And that's important for China because the South China Sea and all this overwhelming slowdown in the Chinese economy, guess what? The South China Sea hasn't gone away. It's still there. And... Uh, you know, that's just all there is to it is, and, and Peter would say, you've got to fold geopolitics into your belief. And part of that is, if you remember, John, I believe we're rolling up on month number nine here. Nine months ago, everybody was waxing philosophical about international equities. Reopening boom. Mm-hmm. boom. China's going to get it done. Dollar's going to weaken. Here we are and in August. DXY easing, easing, easing. 103.48 as well. So, you know, I, you know, I think it's gone back and it's gone back and forth as well, you know. I'm reading about Max Verstappen. I know. I'm, I can I'm, tell. I'm trying to get in. You've been distracted for the last 47 minutes. I've been distracted because I need a new phone. As you know, within the iPhone system, it's an ecosystem, as they say. Samsung is a traditional competitor. And, John, you're all fired up about the anti-fingerprint black version, feather sand glass, the elegance of jade into the palm of your hand. What's it called? The mate something. Yeah, it's a P60 Pro Mate, Mate. whatever, and this is all nice. Huawei. It's all new. Huawei. It's all new. Why don't you bring in Alex Webb here I intend on to. Thanks. Huawei. <laughs> Alex Webb of Flimbo Quick Take joins us now. Alex, how much of a China, China challenge are we about to get to Apple domestically in the mainland? It certainly looks like it's a big play from Huawei to, to take the battle to Apple, but the fact that they've been able to make this is quite remarkable. You know, Huawei's been the subject of significant US uh, sanctions, not least targeting their access to semiconductors. And some of the stuff is unverified, but there are reports online that this includes a five nanometer, a chip bit, bit built on the five nanometer process. And the broad assumption was that Chinese companies, and Huawei in particular, could not get this technology anymore. So. The one thing that maybe will help them, can they make these at scale? Can they make these at the same sort of scale that Apple can? There's a suspicion that maybe they stockpiled a bunch of these chips before the sanctions kicked in Ah. and they're just exhausting those reserves. The fact is, we don't really know. It is fascinating they've been able to make this. Alex, is it a coincidence that the rollout coincided with the visit from the Commerce Secretary? I mean, it certainly looks that way, but it's nonetheless, you know, timely that it has happened at this time. The Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, it is her department that has really been uh, putting in place uh, many of these measures intended to restrict China's access to the bleeding edge uh, semiconductors. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, Raimondo herself had actually been the biggest champion for them. She had been the, the conduit through which the semiconductor industry, the U.S. semiconductor industry, you know, which did not want these sanctions. Of course, it wants they want to have access to the world's to, to the biggest market for this sort of technology. But she certainly was the messenger who had to convey yeah. to them from the Obama administration that they were going to bring these sanctions in. Alex, you're managing director cool here at Bloomberg. Is Huawei cool? Is Samsung cool? Is Apple cool? Whether in London or in Shanghai, who's got the upper hand with the kids? Apple. The Apple's always, and for a long time now, been the cool, the cool player in the space. There was a time when um, the real kind of 
tech aficionados were massively into Android for the ability to personalize various things. But then, of course, you know, there was the realization that, well, Android is you know, a Google product and they're, they're, they have therefore perhaps greater exposure to the Google advertising machine if you're using an Android device. So Apple has stolen a bit of a march on that front. Now, of course, if you want a foldable phone, which there are some parts of the world think are think are the coolest new thing, Samsung is really the player in that space. Some discussion that maybe Apple will develop something similar. In China, I don't know. I don't know whether Huawei has the, has the cool factor. There is a huge push internally to, to champion their, their homegrown products. Maybe this helps. The question is, actually, if there's scarcity, which there might be given the, some of the factors we just discussed, mm. maybe that helps the cool factor. Well, Alex, to me, this is about Huawei versus Apple, but it's also just the U.S. versus China. If you look at the editorial that the Global Times, which, of course, is a mouthpiece for uh, Beijing, published, they say the resurgence of Huawei smartphones after three years of forced silence is enough to prove that the U.S. extreme suppression has failed. It goes on. This also serves as a microcosm of the U.S.-China tech war, reflecting the entire process and foreshadowing the final outcome. Alex, what are your thoughts about this being more broadly about a U.S.-China tech war? I mean, that certainly is, uh, to, to my mind, the most interesting part of, the, of this phenomenon. But let's talk about these five nanometer chips. Firstly, we don't know that they are in the phone, but we have seen reports that they might be. If they are, these are chips that in order to make them at scale and make them in a cost effective manner, you need to have probably, unless somehow China has found a workaround, the bleeding edge equipment, which is the extreme ultraviolet lithography machines. They are made by one company in the world, ASML, a Dutch mm. company. They are not allowed to sell those into China right now. So either China has managed to find a way to make them without EV <coughs> machines, which is a big deal, or they've managed to find a workaround to import them from elsewhere, or the thing we discussed earlier, uh, there aren't going to be many of these devices because they've been stockpiling. Alex, and this is your wheelhouse, all the work that you do at Bloomberg. Tim Cook of Apple has said that privacy is our most essential battle. Discuss that right now. Where are we in 24 months on our most essential battle? Well, don't forget, when Tim Cook says something like that, he does that with bearing with the, his biggest competitor in smartphones in mind, namely Google. And Google is a company that makes a huge amount of money from advertising, i.e. getting a sense of what you're interested in, therefore using some of your browsing and, and internet data to do so. So when he says something like that, he is very much setting up his stool as the anti-Google right. when it comes to smartphones. Now, Apple has done a huge amount to crack down on that. It is way harder now for Facebook or Google to pull data from iPhones without user permission or without users actively volunteering it. So there has been a lot of progress on that front. Nonetheless, there remains a huge amount of seepage. These devices are far from impenetrable. Is his most essential battle an advantage to him in China? I mean, China has for a long time been Apple's, you know, second most important market after North America. It hasn't been growing at the same pace that it had done previously, but it can't afford to uh, get on the wrong side of the Chinese administration. Now, it has a little bit of help there because, of course, it employs millions of people in China directly and indirectly. So it's also in China's interest to keep Apple sweet. But there are plenty of things that Apple has done that have been criticized. For example, making it harder to download VPN apps, which, which people in China would do to circumvent the great Chinese firewall. And they've stored data locally on local cloud servers rather than elsewhere because the suspicion is that means that it's easier for the Chinese government to monitor that data. So it has made plenty of steps to keep the Chinese government, uh, to ensure that they don't get on the wrong side of the Chinese government. I just wish they'd stop changing the charger. TK, that's what does my head in. And then th Changing that's the like charger. this week or whatever. What happened to it's Apple changing. being all about making the user experience yeah, easier, I, I'm seamless, not happy. frictionless? Well said. Well said. And then I, they just change things all the time. And, and around the house, I got like three cables going now. You know, and, and there's it's, there's even stuff ridiculous. I don't know what to plug into because I don't it's, have the cable to plug in whatever. Ridiculous. Alex, yeah. thank you. Alex Webb there. Do you want to talk Nebraska volleyball? We should. Do I, think yes. Have you seen I woke up. <laughs> you I said Max Verstappen or Nebraska volleyball. Nebraska Let's go volleyball. volleyball. Thank you. This is now, I'm told, Tom, the most <clears throat> watched female sporting event ever with a little more than 92,000 wow. people packed into that arena. I didn't think this was real. And then I saw it from ESPN. Tom, just unbelievable. Well, you know, you go out you go out of Chicago and you're driving on I-80 and you hit Des Moines and there's a sign, Denver, 580 miles. And somewhere in between is Nebraska. 
and it's basically Omaha, Lincoln, University of Nebraska. You get gas in Cozad, Nebraska, along you, the way out I-80. Basically saying there's nothing else to do there. There's nothing else to do there. Is that what you just did? This is the activity. You know, grow linebackers. That's what they do. They're very long on linebackers. Not quite Taylor Swift prices, but tickets reach as much as $400 on the secondary market. Did for that they day. really? Really? Yeah. How did this come about, Kaylee? What's this about? I, I don't know. They just decided to break a record? Or is the team that good? I, I, I don't know. There's a lot of red. It looks to me like What it's I love like about Nebraska. this, I was trying to research this this morning. Do we know who won? No, I don't know. <laughs> Nebraska, Nebraska won. They won. Three to, okay, three okay. to zero. Beat it looks Omaha. like a Blink-182 Is three zero in volleyball good? I've got no I idea. No idea. <laughs> I've got no idea. There's sets. 90? Did you say 90,000? Three sets, okay. 92,000. That's 000. like Michigan football. A little more than 92,000. Yeah. You're pumped for college football? Absolutely. Tennessee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Virginia, Go Tennessee, Saturday. Are we still pretending that be there UVA is a football on He's radio. Done three orange bow ties orange in a row. Orange bow ties, three that. days in a row. <laughs> That's a lot of MS. What do you say? Go what? That is a Go lot what? of MS. Go who's? Jay Pulaski at TPW coming up. Go who's? Since the beginning of this hiking cycle, we've tried to say a soft landing is the most likely outcome. We're clearly nowhere near where the Fed wants us to be on inflation, but momentum is easing. The Fed is looking for an excuse not to hike. The Fed has already signaled that they plan to cut rates by 100 basis points next year. I think we've closed the door to a September Fed hike. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. August, coming to a close. It's almost September, a day away. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and on radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with Katie Lyons. Your equity market right now, slightly positive on the S&P, on a four-day winning streak and attempted to make it five. The fate of today's session in the hands of maybe jobless claims a little bit later, Tom, a bunch of other things as well. After a week full of jobs data, heading in the right direction for the doves on the FOMC. I'm going to look at personal income, personal spending as well, but kind of the bull market, and we got Jay Pulaski coming up. Very important conversation here. 13.91 on the VIX. So, this August, August is terrible. Crash in 98, you know, the, the terror August, you know, just go to cash. I said it earlier, we're down 1.6% you know, in August on the terrible. S&P. I mean, don't it's not participate. Bad, is it? And I'm sorry, there we are. And it wasn't just Apple. I mean, yeah, the tech stocks are always there, but other stocks are there because of the wall of money. It has to find a place to go. Okay, Katie, let's wrap it up. We've had ADP, downside yeah. surprise, <clears throat> job openings much lower than anticipated, quits rate falling, tick, 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 thumbs up. Jobless claims a little bit later, then it's on to payrolls tomorrow. Yeah, and the question is, is that going to show more slack building, just like all of the data this week has indicated thus far? And it's not just in the labor market as well. Consumer confidence, too. The idea that maybe because of what you're seeing in the labor market, people are not feeling as confident <clears throat> about the economy. And if you're starting to see the deterioration in all these different areas, maybe that lagged effect of tighter policy starting to show up, John. Dollar General, right on cue, speaking yes. to that. Stock down. It's amazing how she does that. Down hard after cutting sales. And profit outlook for the year. Now seeing EPS, here's the range, 710 to wow. 830, Kaylee. The estimate was $10. And they're talking about a profit hit that they attribute primarily to lower inventory markups and increased shrink. This is something we have heard right about a I lot go. I hate from word, retailers Kaylee. this it's season. It's from the show. We don't say shrink. We call it what it is. Theft. It's theft. Well, there you go. It's theft. And we've heard it time and time again this quarter. And Tom, we've said politically, <clears throat> how does this play yeah. out going into next year? In the general, I don't know about the general election, but I, I would suggest it plays out across everyone's mind 24 7. To review this, John, theft in retail, I'm going to say 2 to 4%. 4% was outrageous. You're talking about companies that have net income margins of 4 cents on the dollar, 7 cents on the dollar. So you take that 2 or 4% off the top line revenue, it just kills you. And, and, you know, this is not 2 to 4% they're talking this about. This stock most painful, too. We're down by almost 15% in the pre-market. It's been at least 10 minutes since we last did this, Tom, so we should do it again. Please. 43 minutes away. Max Verstappen of Red Bull Racing yeah. joining this program. Let's get the promo up. That conversation just around the corner. Let me uh, explain this to an American audience not as riveted on Formula One. The global numbers are absolutely spectacular. 
We're going to go to this in 45 minutes. Simon, thank you so much for making this happen. Max Verstappen is the Michael Jackson of sport right now. He's bigger than Otani. He's bigger than Aaron Judge. He's bigger than what Tom Brady was. It is Tom Brady at peak. He completely dominates a global revenue machine. There's no other way to put it. Dominance is the right word. Yeah. Absolutely dominant. It's not just a car. Nine consecutive yeah, wins. That's well, what i Where's Checo? Where's his teammate? Yeah. I think yeah. that's proof. That I, it's about uh, uh, the driver in this correction. Case. I said Chico earlier. Absolute <laughs> dominance. Looking forward to that conversation yeah. a little bit later. Let's turn to the price action on the S&P 500. <clears throat> Just about holding in there. Positive on the S&P after four days of gains. Yields a little bit lower by two basis points on a 10-year 4.0945%. And euro weakness. Euro weakness with... Inflation coming in hotter than the CCB, Kaylee, <clears throat> wants it to be. Yeah, very interesting to see as you had headline inflation beating expectations, core coming in in line at 6.4%. We are well above target here. So what is the European Central Bank to do when they also are worried about growth? And that was echoed in Isabel Schnabel's comments earlier today. Maybe we'll get some clues as to how they're thinking at 7.30 a.m. Eastern time. That's when we get the ECB's July meeting account. Yes, it's backward looking to July 27th. But what could it tell us about September 14th, just about 25 minutes from now. Then at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, we got a lot of data, so take it piece by piece. Jobless claims, 235,000 is what we're expecting would be an uptick from last week. But again, this comes after you have seen data point after data point pointing to more softness building in the labor market. We get personal income and spending as well. And then the PCE deflator, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. Then finally, after the bell, it's not just Dollar General that's reporting today. Broadcom is going to be reporting. How much are they benefiting from the AI boom? Dollar General, absolutely hammered. Let's turn to the retailers and bring in Jay Pulaski, founder and principal of TPW Advisory. Jay, I want to talk about international equities with you. Of course we do. I want to talk about the retailers domestically here as well, Jay. We've had warning after warning from retailer after retailer. Should I believe them that things are getting worse for this consumer? Well, I think, John, we've got to remember that uh, things are backward looking, right? We're talking about Q2, which is uh, over, been over for several months. Uh, Q3 is coming up and you know, to be honest, we're not exposed to the retail sector. That's not a, a position we hold in our model portfolio. So I don't have any real insight. But I would say that, you know, let's remember consumer real incomes are growing. Unemployment is at record lows. So I think it's maybe more a little bit of a uh, market share battle than it is a signal that the U.S. consumer is weakening. That would be my take. When I look at uh, things like transports, when I look at things like industrials, you know, our focus is on a shift from inflation, recession and Fed concerns to uh, manufacturing recovery, a global CapEx boom and the focus on fiscal, particularly as it applies to public private partnerships and things like the new industrial policy in the U.S. That's to us. That's where the action is. OK, but Jay, it seems like we've gotten confirmation in just the last several days that bad news is actually taken as good news by the market. And if you're suggesting there's consumer resilience, which arguably is good news, is that ultimately going to become bad news if things hang in there just a little too much? Yeah, no, Kaylee, that's a fair point, I think, particularly, though, regarding to uh, the fixed income market, not so much the equity market. Right. I think the equity market is focused on earnings. Uh, we've had a big jump in multiples, so valuation is not going to provide support, at least not in the U.S., rest of the world, extremely cheap. But earnings are going to have to drive things for the stock market in the U.S. And the good news is that not only did Q2 earnings beat, the uh, beat rate was like 80 percent above normal, significantly above normal. So better earnings in Q2 for the market as a whole. And then more importantly, earnings revisions uh, continue to tick up. And we're now looking at consensus for 12 percent earnings growth year over year in 2024. And I think that's what the market is focusing on. The market is focusing on an economy that's not going to go into recession. The okay. Fed is effectively done and earnings are going to grow. And therefore, people feel comfortable putting some money to work. Okay, Jay, so that's the U.S. economy. Let's talk as well about the Chinese economy, because today, just like almost every day lately, it seems we get another step China seems to be taking to shore things up. Today, it's raising child tax breaks or tax breaks on child care in order to boost consumption. We've seen action reportedly looking at mortgage rates, deposit rates, restricting IPOs to shore up the tech market. Does all of it add up to enough? Yeah, no, that's again, Kayla, you're right on the money. Uh, I think, you know, the way I think about China right now is one word, and that word is traction. 
So when are all these little drips and drabs of policy going to actually, you know, kind of <clears throat> do their thing, get traction and move the economy forward? But I think, you know, John may not remember this because he, he talks to tons of people all the time. But the last time I was on the open show with him, I was talking positively about show? and uh, the lights went out huh, on our interview. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, you know, that's what happens when you talk positively about China. The yeah. light, they shut the lights on you. So let's, remember, let's just think about a couple of things, because I am, I have been, and I remain invested in China. Uh, I remain constructive on Chinese equity. And I think the thing, the thing that I love is The Economist. And we all know The Economist cover is a contraindicator. And so they doubled down over the last two weeks. Yeah. They had back-to-back -back negative covers <clears throat> on China. But look, here's a couple of positive points, okay? One, PBOC is injecting liquidity. Two, stocks trade cheaper to the U.S. than they have in 20 years. Three, there's no confirmation in this negativity that everyone seems to uh, love to talk about. Look at uh, the tech companies in China. Alibaba had its best first quarter since it went public. So the consumer in China is not like hiding under a rock. They have plenty of room to consume. It is a confidence issue, but new car sales right. are up. E-commerce is up. So I, I, I remain uh, constructive. And look, the China position we put on almost a month ago was uh, K-Web, and it's down 3% from when we put it on. Yeah. Given all this negativity, that's perfectly right. fine for me. Jay, Jay, i got to be quick here. Uh, it is that time of year. Many talk, few do. Number 66 for the Fighting Blue Devils used to do. You played major football. I want to know in 1978, what was it like when you walked into Michigan, 105,000 fans? <laughs> what was that like as a kid? Oh, my God, Tom. I shouldn't have mentioned that I was a, I played for Duke. You looked that up in the five minutes before we talked. <laughs> and there. That's awesome. You guys have some serious fact checkers there. We do. Uh, it's a deep team. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> you need to be in to play in Michigan, and we were not deep enough to play with them. We actually got annihilated in that game. I was a sophomore. I played a lot. I was a defensive tackle, but we got annihilated in that yeah. game. My dad my brother went out to see us, and it was pretty miserable, but – you know, I'm happy to report that Duke football is in a much better place today than it was then. We have a top-rate coach. We have a great team. We have a lot of guys back. And we're going to surprise the world. Here you go, guys. We're going to surprise the world by beat Clemson yeah. Monday night, ESPN, national TV. I will be there. Uh, John, we can talk about it after. Right. Tom, we'll talk about it after. But but Jay. You, you, you bounced back the next weekend and crushed UVA 20 to 13. <laughs> I mean, you came off the Michigan crater and you just pounded Virginia as only Ew. Duke can do. Oh, there, Tom, I love you, buddy. I'm, I'm so impressed by all this. Jay, he's got the results in front of him on his screen. He's got it all lined up. Jay, thank you. Appreciate Jay, thank it. You're you. one Number of the best. 66. Just one of the best. Jay Polsky of TPW Advisory. True story, you know, the lights did go out when he started talking bullishly about China. I, did, I didn't switch him off, just to be very clear. How cool is that? Can you imagine walking out to that as a kid? I, you know, unreal. everybody's got the memories. Atmosphere. He played some serious D1 sports and... Uh, you know, and he was a guard, too. It's like rugby, John. Guard's like a job. I mean, you know, he's not like, you know, running around like a quarterback being a stud. He's a big he's dude. He's, he's a big dude. Yeah. If you're just tuning in, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 here, positive by zero. 0.1%. In the bond market, yields a little bit lower by a basis point or two on a 10-year, 4.0984%, way off the highs from a few Tuesdays ago of 436. We've had a big move lower in yields over the past week off the back of what the Fed might describe as encouraging economic data, Tom. They might call it yeah. further progress. I'm going to link Chris Verona in with Jay Pulaski here, and I'm going to notice oil creeping. It's a grind. It's not a grind. That, that, that's not a stress, but Brent crude 86.50 rounded up to 87, marching, as they say towards $90 a barrel. Just waiting for that stimulus from China, Tom. Yeah. And dare I say, maybe Europe waiting for it as well. <laughs> I would have said at the start of the year that might be a problem for the Eurozone, but given the growth backdrop at the moment, Tom, maybe it's something they might, well, might want. We're scheduled for London in September, and one of my top interviews there, if we can get him around his travel schedule, is, is the hydrocarbon people at J.P. Morgan. And that's their arch thesis, is that, like Jay says, 
Uh, demand doesn't go away. I mean, demand stays where it is and is burgeoned by countries that aren't having esoteric debates like America. And let's get you the lineup for this morning. So in about an hour from now, 45 minutes away or so, Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth. We'll talk to her about this equity market as we round out things for the month of August. And then looking ahead to the politics, a really, really upsetting moment again, Tom, oh, for Senator Mitch McConnell. God, this is. We'll catch you with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. In DC, the in just last a moment. 24 hours of American political news. You know, we don't need to go into it now, but it's an important time to talk to Anne Marie. Difficult, yeah. uh, upsetting really. images, really upsetting yeah. images. Yeah. I have to say, for the second time, try to do this with grace. in a couple of months. Absolutely. Yeah. From New York City this morning. Good morning. About 30 minutes away. Good morning, Max. Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen, just around the corner. Since the beginning of this hiking cycle, we've tried to say a soft landing is the most likely outcome. Uh, the economy is not going to go into recession as a base case forecast. And so far, that view has right. come true. Things are cooling off a bit, but they're not cold. For us, we still think it is a recession avoided. That's been our view for a long time. Seth Carpenter, chief global economist over at Morgan Stanley, potentially recession avoided and not just delayed. We'll look out for some economic data a little bit later. Jobless claims in America about an hour and 14 minutes from now. Then on to payrolls tomorrow. In the equity market at the moment on the S&P 500, just a little bit of a lift by 0.1% on the S&P 500 following a four-day winning streak. Yields coming in again on a 10-year by a couple of basis points, 4.0925% on a 10-year yield. Tom, I think we have to start this segment with some difficult pitches. Yeah. Some difficult pitches yeah. again for Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, who appeared to freeze for the second time in a number of months in public, Tom, following a question for his thoughts on seeking re-election. And anybody that knows the gentleman from uh, Kentucky knows that there's a vibrancy lost. I don't think that's ungraceful to say this is a change that Mitch McConnell and harkens back to all sorts of memories in the nation. Kaylee mentioned on the break the senator from California having some of the same troubles. But I would take it back to Reagan and Bush Sr. And in the history of here, someone like Michael Beschloss would go immediately back to Woodrow Wilson of how we adapt to quite elderly government officials. Well, Tom, let's go through it. There are many upsetting aspects, dimensions of those pictures that we all saw in the last 24 hours. And first and foremost, our thoughts with the man himself, Mitch McConnell, and we hope he is well. Tom, the aid stepping in, I think that's what's concerning for a lot of people beyond his health, because what it conveys, it is OK to be supported. You expect them to be supported, Tom, by the aides around them, not led by them. <clears throat> and when you put these pictures together with what we saw from Dianne Feinstein, the Democrat, in a similar situation, Tom, who didn't appear to realise where she was or what she was doing and needed to be led by an aide <clears throat> to yeah. vote. Yeah. Now, these individuals are elected to lead, Tom. We don't elect the aides around them to lead them on our behalf. That's not what this democracy is all about. Yeah, I think it's not a, just in the United no, States, but, it, but elsewhere it's, it's too. Gone, so increasingly seeing yeah. those pictures, I think that's why it's deeply problematic, I'm, Tom. I'm going to suggest through all of uh, our history, there's always been one fossil to be light about it in the Congress and Capitol and the Senate and the House are two, three, four. Quincy Adams was quite elderly uh, at the end. But now it's the number of people we're talking about, including the analysis of the of the present president and the past uh, president. There's it's, it's not just one or two people now. It's a whole set of people are saying, why are you sticking around? Well, the conversation's happening, Tom. Term limits, age limits. I'm uncomfortable with saying that once you get to a certain age, Tom, mm. you don't have the mental acuity to lead. I'm uncomfortable with that. One man <clears throat> at 80 is completely different to another. And Tom, I yeah. think it's going to be very difficult to deal with this as a country, but it's seemingly something that we've all got to face and got to deal well, with, given what's happening in America at the moment. And just in the last uh, 24 hours, Nicole Norea and Karen uh, Lamman over at Vox, I mean, yes, they speak to the senator's uh, challenges, but they also have six, seven, eight paragraphs of the of the, the plot, if you will, on Capitol Hill. Gracefully, we address this issue with Anne-Marie Horton, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Anne-Marie, your thoughts yesterday as we observe this really difficult video. 
It's very challenging to watch. It's very uncomfortable. And you feel for Mitch McConnell in this moment. He's being asked about whether or not he will seek reelection. And for 30 seconds, even longer than we saw him pause uh, in this incident we saw just last month in July on Capitol Hill, yesterday he was in Kentucky, he could not answer. And aides, as Jonathan said, had to step in. So obviously we wish uh, Senator McConnell well. His team came out and said he had got lightheaded, seemed to take a pause, and he would see a doctor before his next event. But obviously there's growing concerns now, given that this happened so frequently it, from the last incident. Um, and of course, when you have concerns like that, there's obviously going to be, right. you know, some murmuring around Capitol Hill about who would take his position. Right. Um, you know, Rick Scott, senator from Florida, who actually challenged Mitch McConnell for this leadership contest last year, was asked about this on right. CBS. And he said he sees that Mitch McConnell will um, lead them through the remainder um, right. of this session. And then potentially there'll be someone, uh, you know, he'll just have to wait. They'll all have to wait until the next leadership contest. And, and Marie, his, his wife, Mitch McConnell's wife, Elaine Chow, has been hugely supportive of what I've done at Bloomberg with all of her service to the Republican Party and to the nation. People like you in the Beltway, do you try to observe what the families are doing and advising in these difficult times? Well, it was just about a year ago I actually sat down with Elaine Chow, um, incredible woman in terms of her, you know, rise to the top on boards, a number of administrations, not obviously just the prior administration, but she's worked throughout Republican administrations. And sometimes people don't know that she's actually married to leader Mitch McConnell. But in this moment, you know, you're not going to hear a lot from the family. The staff is really going to want to deal with this and they're not really going to say a lot. Um, you're going to see the the press release that we got yesterday and the emails and text messages we got yesterday, which is that just this was just a blip. Um, you know, we'll make sure everything's OK. But he's been you know, they say he's been fine out and about at events, speaking engagements. And that's the most you're going to see. But you're not going to see a lot of individuals want to talk about this that are very close to him. They're going to want to make sure that they're just doing this from the staff press releases, and that's about it. And a lot of people are going to come to his defense. Well, this isn't just, as John was alluding to earlier, Anne-Marie, about Mitch McConnell. This is about the age of a number of powerful individuals in Washington, be it Senator Dianne Feinstein, who, of course, was absent from the Senate for an extended period after dealing with shingles and has had difficulties since she returned, but also the man sitting in the Oval Office, President Biden, who also is in his 80s. He's an octogenarian as well, and we know that voters are starting to have more of a problem with age. Yeah, they are. I mean, the, the recent AP NORC poll this week, I think, really highlights this conversation, which is that the majority of Americans, um, even the majority of Democrats, think Biden is too old. Now, the Democrats say they will vote for him regardless, but they do think he's too old to have another four years. And then interesting, also in that poll, the majority of Americans, we're talking 65, 67, 68 percent, thinks there needs to be retirement age for Supreme Court justices and thinks there needs to be term limits on those seeking elected office, whether the House or the Senate, as well as the presidential. So this is something that is going to continuously come up. Nikki Haley, the former U.N. ambassador, obviously GOP hopeful for the presidential uh, candidacy, uh -huh. uh, the nominee, she has said there should be mental acuity tests of those over the age of 75. The issue is when you start talking mm -hmm. about maybe making this legislation, this is a very old Congress. Yeah. Do they really want to vote on legislation that could potentially yeah. see those in their 50s or 60s not be able to have the career they potentially want? <clears throat> Emery to Segui here in a clumsy way from these true difficulties that, that, that bring the nation together is bringing the nation apart. And that's people that believe Donald Trump or not. Were you surprised at the bombshell revaluation of real estate that we heard from a court yesterday on the, I guess, the net worth of the former president? Um, I'm not sure if I'm surprised by um, all of this we see with the former president, given just the slew of, of, of legal battles he's facing. Um, and this one being the latest, I was a little bit intrigued about the deposition and the transcript we have from that deposition, where he talked actually more about his time in office. Um, he said that he didn't really know what was going on with the company business, didn't really have time or chance to look at it during his time in office. He wasn't running the company because he said he was saving millions of people and talked about um, nuclear discussions he had with North Korea, saving America from a 
nuclear war. Very interesting stuff if you look at really the back and forth of the transcript and almost seemed as though the president was personally insulted that the New York attorney general said he inflated his assets and he said those assets are, you know, best in the world. By $2.2 billion, Tom. Not just by a little bit. By two point two billion dollars. Well, we're advantaged here at Bloomberg with Tim O'Brien, who long before we had a presidential candidate was reviewing the finances of the Trump family and of Donald Trump. And I look forward on Bloomberg opinion to seeing what Mr. O'Brien writes about this reveal. I've had some off the record conversations with Tim where he's clearly borderline encyclopedic on each and every tower. And I'm really looking forward to to what Tim O'Brien says. I'm pleased someone is. Yeah. Because we're not. We're not. And I just, so. I just, you know, Afterthought skated on his ice rink in Central Park that he wrote the check on. That's all I know. Deborah Cunningham is coming up a little bit later from Federated Hermes on this equity market. Four-day winning streak on the S&P could well become five. A special thanks to AMH down in Washington. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Equities up just a little bit on the S&P by 0.1%. No drama here going into jobless claims one hour from now, just 60 minutes away. Claims and then on to payrolls on Friday. Equities totally unchanged on the Nasdaq for all the drama for a month of losses. In the month of August, Tom, we're down to 1.6%. On the all the S&P. drama. It's, it's for really those, not much. For those older, we're always scarred by August of 1998, which is just a few years ago. It seems like yesterday. But there is this angst about August and, quite frankly, John, about September as well. And it's sort of as silly as sell in May and go away or like last year, sell in October and go away. I mean, these calendar cliches get you into trouble. The angst has eased off the back of this move in the bond market. And I think we should talk about ranges where we have been yeah, and where we range are. Range is the right word. Let's get to the bond market. Two year, 10 year, 30 year. Just slice up the yield curve through those three maturities. The two year at 486.50. So the two year, the high of the week was 5.1%. So we've had a massive move lower off the back of job openings, which came in much, much much, much lower than anticipated. Quits rate lower as well. ADP, whatever that's worth, downside surprise, just encouraging the move even further. <clears throat> so the two years had a big range over the last week. And the 10-year as well. A few Tuesdays ago, 436. And right now, a 10-year, a break of 4.1%, Tom, and down another two well, basis points on the day. And what's important about this is those yields, John, take away inflation, and you've got some form of constructive positive real yield. That's not the case in Europe. That's the, the, that's the stark, stark difference as we go to September. Let's turn to the euro just briefly. Lots to talk about for the euro. The data very much in focus. The euro against the dollar right now. Euro dollar 108.66, mm. negative 0.5% going into the ECB meeting on September 14th. Under surveillance this morning, pressure not letting out for the ECB's rate decision a few weeks away. Eurozone inflation coming in at 5.3%, slightly above the 5.1% estimate year over year. Meanwhile, over in China, manufacturing picking up slightly with the latest PMI coming just under the key 50 level. And in many ways, Tom, for Europe, those story, two well, stories are linked. What happens in China is going to shape things in Europe. And the reaffirmation from Gorgieva as we talked to her at Jackson Hole, the managing director of the IMF, looking at a five-year vision of global growth, which, which, you know, I mean, we're just eight months into their historic call. But the answer is we're certainly seeing tepid global growth as the IMF was uh, nudging towards. What would the ECB do? In a few weeks' time, I've got absolutely no idea. Isabel Schnabel of the executive board, non-committal. President Lagarde going into the next meeting, non-committal. The account of the last meeting, Kaylee, any clues in that? Preference was initially expressed for not hiking, though eventually all members supported the 25 basis point rate increase. Does that mean maybe there would be a know. preference for not hiking in September? Can any of us really tell by what they're saying? The fact that Lagarde didn't offer anything at all, Tom, Nothing whatsoever in Jackson Hole just tells you, I don't think they know where they're going to go in a few weeks' time. In fact, the Hawks may hold the clue, the key to what they're going to do. Even they sound non-committal. Yes, Even they the polarity, sound non-committal. The, 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 they're talking about maybe the, doing some more in the future, but certainly not saying in September I'm going to march into the room and demand a 25 basis point hike. And they, there's a greater complexity there, nonetheless, because of the war 
uh, in Ukraine. But the, it, Jackson Hole, the polarity, John, between Germany and Portugal, just as one example of the complexities, and that's different than, say, Netherlands, United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, away from this, I quite frankly, is part of the debate. I bring this up because we have got some Fed speak to talk about, away from the ECB talk. Rafael Bostic does not have a vote, but he continues to side with the doves, warning to be, maybe, a little bit more careful about what happens next, Katie Lyons. Let's get to the quote. Based on current dynamics in the macro economy, I feel policy is appropriately restrictive. I think we should be cautious and patient and let the restrictive policy continue to influence the economy, lest we risk tightening too much and inflicting unnecessary economic pain. The latest Fed speak there. I want to finish on this. Dollar General shares tumbling after the company cut its 2014, 2024 <coughs> net sales and profit forecast. That stock is down by 16%, Katie. Absolutely <laughs> hammered. Yeah. And they're talking about in the quarter they just reported how profit, the decrease in gross profit was attributable to lower inventory markups and increased shrink, a word Tom does not like, markdowns and inventory damages. But I think you asked a really important question earlier on in the show. What is it that retailers are actually signaling? about the health of the U.S. consumer. They're not alone, Tom. Dollar General. In fact, even the likes of Walmart and Target were talking up potentially a softer quarter given the student loan resumptions. Yeah. A warning, potentially, for retail in America. New and sudden rollover for Dollar General. 10-year track record, 12.3% per year total return. Pretty, pretty good for making $1 purchases uh, there. This is an extremely well-timed conversation that we have right now. Coming up in 15 minutes, Max Verstappen. But more importantly, Deborah Cunningham joins us, Global Liquidity Market CIO at Federated Hermes and truly owns a high ground on short-term paper. I'm going to go through the math on this uh, because... Because a lot of people have asked about the new uh, ETF we've got coming out next year, Deborah. But on the triple leveraged all cash fund, I got a 5.43% three-month T-bill. I'm leveraging that up three times. I'm popping 16.29% gross return. And then I take out my 2% fee and my 20% overage. Okay, that's an esoteric thing. The simple thing is people are addicted to the 5.43% in your world. How long is that three-month T-bill yield going to last? You know, Tom, we think it's lasting longer than maybe the market expects. Even though you see Fed, Fed speak like, like Bostic and even to some degree um, Chair Powell at Jackson Hole last week trying to temper back people's expectations from a standpoint of further increases. Um, maybe this September meeting is a skip not a pause. Maybe we go again in November. Um, but in any case, I think the 5.43 and where we are generally in short term right. rates stay with, stays with us through the end of this year. It stays into the <clears throat> beginning of next year. Um, right now, I, I, I think FedSpeak should be you know, focusing on trying to take people's expectations away from the next cuts. Um, they, they're not coming soon. That, that yeah. five. But that above five is there for a while. Deborah, you and Federated on the high ground on this. What is the financial effect of, dare I say, trillions going to money market funds? What's the so what if everybody piles in to 5.43%? You know, it's a huge positive. You know, we talked, you were talking earlier about student loan resumption. Well, what you can get from a standpoint of earning 5.43% now on your cash helps with the, what the payments that are now due on, you know, the, the, the amounts in student debt and other payments um, that have escalated from a mortgage, from an auto loan standpoint. All those things have gone up. But if you're earning more, if you're at 5% rather than zero, we were at 0 0.5 for a very long time. Time, you're you're better you're better off from a net worth standpoint and being able to pay that extra that's required for your liabilities. Deborah, Kaylee was just going through the accounts of the last ECB meeting. Let's turn to that. Concern was raised that the economy might be facing stagflation. Is that your base case for the eurozone economy? It isn't. Um, you know, probably if we looked at the Eurozone, Asia, the UK and the US, we'd pick the Eurozone as the highest potential for that. But we still feel like there's enough, um, you know, positive momentum in many of the countries to to keep stagflation, keep rates above, you know, where, where the inflationary rate is. Um, yes, you've got some counters to that from an energy standpoint, still supply side issues, uh, supply chain issues in the European economy, but it's not our base case for that 
for that area. Let's just go one step further. Let's say we do get that. Deborah, I mentioned this yesterday. I'd love your input on the subject. How do bonds trade in a stagflationary world? What would that look like? Well, you're looking at something that, you know, is basically probably on par, if not less than than what's happening from a stagflation or an inflationary rate. Um, and, and as such, you're probably losing uh, in the process of your investing or at least in the cash portion of it. And, you know, I, I think people still at that point take the high ground. They take the, you know, less risky, maybe you're not getting enough of a return in those asset classes to beat what's happening from the the, the stagflationary environment, but at least you're not losing too, too much in the process either. Deborah, to, to pull a direct quote from the minutes after they raised the concern about stagflation, the minutes say, in view of the prevailing uncertainties and the large costs of bringing inflation down once it had become entrenched, it was argued that it was preferable to tighten monetary policy further than to not tighten it enough. Granted, this is from July 27th. There's no telling that the preference would still be for over tightening rather than under tightening in September for either the ECB or the Federal Reserve. But what are we going to know if they actually already did over tighten? Well, you know, it, there's lead time to everything that happens. So I think it's, you know, month to month to month. There's and, and certainly no central bank in the world to include the ECB, to include the Fed, wants to have a jagged line up, down, up, down. Um, they're not that responsive. They like to go in a trend on, you know, toward one level, stay there for a while and then maybe reverse course, but not reversing course multiple times in a year, unless there's something that warrants it. That's, you know, sort of out of the, uh, the, 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 the in the extraordinary type of picture at that point. But I, I think that you've got probably with most of most countries tightening cycles, you've got at least a six month <clears throat> lead time. So we're not going to know this information for whether they've tightened too much now until t- until 2024. Deborah, we don't do forecasts here. We do best guesses. Can we do best guesses for next month? <laughs> ECB and the Federal Reserve. You expect in action from one and not the other? No, I think they both are in a skip mode at this meeting. Okay. Deborah, thank you. Deborah Cunningham there. Phenomenal. Of Federated Hermes. Just one of the best. Great to catch up with the rest of no love. I mean, Deborah gets absolutely no love. Steve Othrock's in the room. Is that not enough love? No, we give her, we're the only ones that give her love. We're the only ones that she comes on. But short term paper, it's not sexy. You know, it's like, you know, for 13 month CD. It gives you something now. Three month T bill, whatever. Finally, they're back in conversation and they still don't get love versus, should I buy the Austrian T bill of 97 years? Is that sexy? See? <laughs> That's sexy. That sexy. Oh yeah. When, I think you, when you lose as much money as Nvidia, I've lost in the Austrian, the Nvidia's, way sexy. The Nvidia's of this world might be. Yeah, or, or the sexy. Huawei's. The Huawei's. Huawei. 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 I got I got Tanya Chen in Hong Kong. Huawei. Said, Tom, you're mispronouncing it. So. We're doing it right now. I don't know. I can't remember. Huawei. I think we are. She was those ECB me. minutes accounts, whatever the ECB likes to call them. <laughs> Kelly, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. How does that guide your thoughts into shape your thoughts into the meeting next month? Well, given that these are backward looking, I don't I don't know. But the thing is, what they're talking about has only perhaps become even more en- evident. Still in elevated inflation outlook. We got more evidence of that in the data this morning, 5.3% on the headline year over year figures. And yet you also are seeing some of the growth deterioration still showing up. So do they have any more clarity going into so, this next meeting than they had on that story oh, on. back in July. Their minutes, whatever they're called, are sanitized, right? I mean, what are they really talking about? Well, they're far the more scenes? sanitized than yeah. the Fed minutes. Are, yeah. <clears throat> what are the they ECB talking accounts. about? Uh, sign- Tom, it gives me, the impression, <laughs> gives me the impression this really is a game time decision for the ECB yes. in that two-day meeting. Yeah, and Like truly a live meeting, getting around the table and figuring this out. Lagarde in a New York speech made very clear it's, it's a jumbled system. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Equities elevated here by zero. 0.2% potentially heading towards a fifth day of gains. Two teases, a tease, Tom. <laughs> One with Andrew Hollenhorst, who is the best guest in the next hour. City at 8.30, or this guy right here, Max Verstappen of Red Bull Racing, coming up next on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Yeah, John's going to drive the interview because he's the only one who knows what he's talking about. <laughs> drive. I've been, but I've been nice. reading the literature on this, and to me, it's the whole. It's like sort of like the horse and horse racing. Everybody says, "Well, it's the car." 
And if if Checo is it starts in 14th position and gets up to seventh position, it's the car. Or if Max is in second or third and wins, as he always does, it's the car. That's what I want to explore to him. I don't buy it. It's Max. Yeah. The dominance of Max Verstappen. Tom, if you put <clears throat> Max next to anybody right now in that car, Max is winning. And the best way yeah, of judging and- this is judge him against his teammate. And there's a massive gap at the moment. It has been all season for most of this can we, season. Can we remind ourselves this kid is 25? I know. He's been doing know, it since he's 15. He won his first race in the big time at 17. As, as far as I understand it, he did a year in Formula <clears throat> One before he actually got his driving license. I think license. he's only coming on because he's, he's, you know, he's interested in the triple leverage all cash fund. Should we talk to him about the bond yeah, market? You know, Let's not what's do he doing that. with this money? I hate that yeah. stuff. I don't like asking athletes about exactly. investing money. That is <laughs> just... A, against the rules on this program. Yeah, we don't do it. I mean, we're not, you know. Yeah, Max Verstappen, Red Bull Racing. Thanks for your comments. Coming up next. Let's get you up to speed on the price action just briefly and start with the S&P 500. Equities here oh. positive by 0.3% on the S&P. Four-day winning streak on the S&P, the longest winning streak back to mid-July. We are on course to make it five on the S&P 500. That winning streak trimming the month-to-date loss to 1.6%. That would make it the first monthly loss since February, which tells you a lot about the year so far. A year of double-digit gains on the S&P 500. And on the Nasdaq too. The Nasdaq, by the way, heading towards a second week of gains. In the bond market, Treasury shaping up as follows. The 10-year yield at 4.0925%, down a couple of basis points. The 10-year, a couple of Tuesdays ago, last week, 4.36. Yields have dropped all the way in from there to a low of about 4.08% yesterday. The range on the two-year this week alone, wide, wide, wide. 5.1% at the high. The two-year this morning dropping into the 480s at 486 and down a couple of basis points. So that's the bond market. Let's finish on foreign exchange. The euro at 108.65, negative by 0.5%. That is a weaker euro. Inflation all week, whether it is Italy, Spain or Germany, it has been upside surprise, upside surprise for the eurozone inflation story. With CPI coming in hot, there is a question about whether the ECB makes a move in a couple of weeks' time on September 14th. There was some reluctance to make a move, Tom, around that table last time around yeah. at the Governing Council. You wonder if that reluctance carries over into the meeting on the 14th. That's going to be sport as well. And again, as you said earlier, John, I think it's really, really data dependent. But, you know, on Labor Day, which is sort of like New Year's for the business community, to get the kids back in school and uh, begin out into September... Uh, as as well. And and John, I'm just going to point out that from the Ralph Ann Campora, Ed Yardeni low, I'm up 24% from the October low, Standard & Poor's 500. I mean, I know the S&P is not performing. It's only Apple. Just learning that Max is a little busy, Tom. He's <clears> going to be delayed 10 percent. minutes. So okay, well, Max you know. is going to be late about 10 minutes. We're still going to make this conversation happy. He's got things to do this weekend, I'm told. There's a race in Monza. <laughs> well, he's busy. You know, you know, he's like busy. Taking dominating. his time getting to the camera. You know what he's got? You know, let, you know, let's take a moment here. When you look at their car with all the stickers on it or their, their uniforms. Or the sponsorship. The sponsorships. If he, if he spends 15 minutes with each sponsor... That's why he's 10 minutes late to Bloomberg surveillance. Because he's got to do the circuit. Yeah, he's probably, or he's having a Red Bull, you know, could be. Do you think he drinks that stuff? I don't know. You should ask him. They do when they're victory. Do you think they drink the champagne? I mean, the guy's like coated in champagne 24-7. Yeah, I wonder what that is. Yeah. You can ask him that too. There's two questions. You've Somebody got, dropped the trophy the a couple pocket. days ago. I saw that. That's been remade, apparently. <clears throat> yeah. Hungary. They've remade that. We hope that Max Verstappen will join us here uh, right now. We had to go find somebody to to follow up with after Max Verstappen is 10 minutes late and never late is Michael McKee, Bloomberg Economics and Policy Correspondent. You were standing to the side as I was warbling gaily with Christine Lagarde. She's not Jay Powell. What's the number one difference that she has in the day-to-day grind of central banking versus what the American central banker has? Uh, She has... 19 different countries to worry about, whereas the Fed president, uh, Fed chairman has only one. So monetary policymaking is a little bit more difficult in the sense that there are 
differences between the various economies. You get some like Croatia growing 3% this year, some like Germany growing 0% or a little bit less. And so the impact of raising rates is different on different countries. And so they will have different views. And she's got to make everybody get together and come up with a, a consensus on what to do. Well, when you look at the account, Mike, and, and I read this line earlier, but it was argued that it was preferable to tighten monetary policy further than to not tighten it enough. And this is a conversation we hear at the Federal Reserve as well. Loretta Mester, for example, leaning more toward over-tightening than under-tightening. Raphael Bostic, though, just earlier today, suggested the opposite. Do we have really any idea what the preference would be, where which way they would lean at this point? Well, the majority say they would rather over tighten than under tighten. They don't want to send the economy into recession. But if we start to see a real deterioration in the economy, they can cut rates. What they don't want to see is inflation go back uh, up again. And so they're going to lean in the direction of higher rates. Now, we're within 25 basis points probably of any kind of peak. So does it really matter all that much? Not a huge amount. It's more of a signal than anything else at this point. Does the data this morning that we have yet to get really matter all that much? Jobless claims, spending, PCE deflator. Well, the the PCE numbers are going to matter because that's the uh, gauge the Fed follows for inflation. Particularly, uh, Jay Powell's been looking at the so-called super core when you mm -hmm. take core services X housing. And uh, Rafael Bostic was making the point this morning that if you do that, if you take out housing, then mm -hmm. you have your core running about one point, uh, no, about uh, two point nine percent. So you're getting into the area the of, handles right of, of, of what you want to see. I, I want to go to the great unspoken, which is this theme that the savings, the fiscal stimulus of the pandemic is worn out. You're gonna is this right, Mike? That you can calculate today the quote unquote savings rate of Americans. Well, you can calculate the savings rate, yes. And we look at that as some sort of measure of whether or not people are uh, still have enough money to keep spending what are we doing without right going now? to I credit mean, cards. I mean, the haves are saving. They're doing We're, 401ks and all yeah. that. Two-thirds of the nation's not savings, right? Well, it's uh, weird because 401ks aren't counted because the money comes out of your paycheck. They're looking at the net uh, money that you have left over after taxes, and they subtract what you spend, and that's the residual that they call the savings rate. So it is a little bit uh, a little bit odd, but uh, people aren't going to be spending their four hundred one ks anyway to on on regular goods. So it's it's uh, the best <clears throat> proxy we have on a. Uh, easy to figure out basis, and it has come down to about four point one percent, but. Um, we don't know if Americans are spent out Thank yet. You. They keep spending. Thank you. We keep hearing the same thing over the last year, that this is the quarter, this is the quarter, and now we're told this is the quarter. Mike, do house prices matter when they're so distorted by this Federal Reserve? Well, the change in house prices matters. That's the issue for the Fed. Is when housing prices go up, it adds to CPI and PCE inflation on a percentage basis. But remember, it takes about a year to get into the data. So house prices are going up now because things are distorted, but they went down. And so what we should start seeing is declining housing prices, uh, a declining effort, a, a, a weakening, weakening of inflation based on that. So further progress, potentially. This came up at Jackson Hole. It's worth talking about for the rest of this year. Might that was a great, you asked the question, and it was years. a great question of Pat Harker. You never say that to me. Because they're <laughs> ready. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, beyond that, going into next year, there is a feeling that we get down to three, and then it gets really hard to get down to two. This was something that dominated the conversation in Jackson Hole. The Fed chair says the target is two. Then you ask the people around the meeting, is the target really two? Are they willing to cause that pain in the labor market to go from three to two? And you start to get pushed back. What's your insight on that, your take on what's actually happening on the committee? Is there a tolerance there for above 2% inflation? There's a tolerance, but an unspoken tolerance in the sense that it's going to take a long time probably to get that last mile from three to two. And what they're going to do is leave rates. They won't raise rates, but they'll leave rates as long as they can high to see if they can bring it down to the 2% level, get into that area. Uh, there is a feeling that they can maybe do that. Then 
wait until 2025 when they review their monetary policy operations and then say, okay, we'll go to a, a 3% uh, target or something like that. Uh, because if, if the economy stays growing at a faster pace, then your neutral rate has risen and your uh, target can rise. But it's also about credibility too, right? The Fed can't be seen saying all right, never mind. We can't get there, so we're changing our target. Well, it's the same way, uh, the same thing we see in Jay Powell's speeches and all their speeches when they refuse to use the R word. They talk about <laughs> pain. Uh, yep. they, they talk about uh, less than trend growth, but they never say recession. They're never going to say recession because we know everybody at a trading desk will immediately hit sell the minute that word comes out <laughs> of their mouth. Mike McKee, just great work, as always, over in Jackson Hole. It's just great to watch Mike McKee work the room, TK. Oh, yeah, well, you know, get together. It's just you, fantastic. You, you go into the million dollar cowboy bar, and you know, I'm over at the left bar. And McKee's working the whole long right side bar. He's working the room. <laughs> Fed officials just surrounding yeah, him. He's working the room with a glass of water. Raphael, with a how glass you doing? of water in my hands. We want to make sure management this, knows that. This, this one, not a glass of water. Mike, thank you. <sighs> Coming up in about five minutes' time, we'll discuss this market, wrap up August, look ahead to September and those key central bank meetings with Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth and Max Verstappen. Stand by, Tom. I'm told he's working his way towards the camera. We're going to make this happen with Red Bull Racing yeah. over in Monza for the race this weekend in Italy. Very, very exciting. And a lot to talk to him about. And, you know, we, I don't think we'll get to it. Zandvoort, the rain never stopped. But have you seen the party? Did you see the yeah. party yeah. in the Netherlands? It yeah. rained, the race stopped, but the DJ kept going and everyone seemed yeah. to have a great time. They did. What's that about? It's about Max. It's a song about court. Max. Ferrari, Monza, that looks ugly. That doesn't look good, eh? <laughs> Doesn't look good at Car all. Car talk with Tom Keen. Very good. From New York, this is Bloomberg. The Fed has achieved what they wanted to, at least thus far. The Fed is likely to let past increases in policy do their work. They're likely to let the lags have their impact. I think by the end of this year, you're going to see inflation with the two print. There's no recession in sight because everything in the economy in the U.S. is really pretty well balanced. I think the one area that's going to disappoint is jobs. I think there are going to be downward revisions. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. Not a sleepy August week. It is more than busy. Kaylee Lines in for Lisa Abramowitz. And in this hour, we will look at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. And we will also look at what John Farrow calls the temple of speed. Monza this weekend. Very this cool. This is fun. Week after week, they take the road show from Zandvoort in the Netherlands down to near Milan, right? This is Ferrari's home race. Top speed of more than 200 miles an hour. Average speed at something like 150, 160. Not many turns. These guys are going yeah. fast, Tom. This is like one of the races on the calendar that I love to see. Right. Unfortunately for Ferrari fans, things aren't going so well going into this weekend. Lots going on here. And we can say good morning to all of you worldwide who just love Formula One. It's burgeoning. And what's Las Vegas? Are we going to Las Vegas? If we can find tickets. Why don't you ask our next guest? Okay, well, we can get us tickets. Some. <laughs> Maybe we can get us tickets as well. Who should we speak to? And as we've talked to Christian Horner and others of Formula One, there's always a desire to talk to the gentleman who truly dominates and owns the high ground. And John, as you bring in Mr. Verstappen, all I can say is this kid was in show. He was in the show. He was in the big time before he had his driver's license. Amazing. Amazing, Amazing. isn't it? Before he had his Dominance driver's license. Dominance is the word. Max Verstappen of Red Bull Racing joins us right now. Max, good morning, buddy. It's great to catch up with you, sir. Nine wins in a row. Just phenomenal. You're trying to make it 10 at Monza. How special would that be? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's something that I never even, you know, told about that that is even possible, right? But now that we have won nine in a row, uh, tying the record, um, of course, you want more. And uh, I think we have, a, we have a good opportunity, but... Um, F1 races are never uh, straightforward. There are a lot of things that can uh, can happen. Um, but yeah, I'm excited, of course, for the weekend. Max, let's go back a couple of decades. Tell me back to the days when you were in a go-kart and you got to be around people like Michael Schumacher and your father, for that matter, as well. Is that where this hunger, desire comes from to dominate, even after you get win after win? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, of course, you need, you, you, you really want it uh, from a young age but um, I think also the way I grew up um, you know having the experience of my dad by my side um, yeah for sure from a very young age I think you um, 
you know, get prepared in a in a different way, I guess. And uh, yeah, for me, it's never good enough. You know, even um, you try to you know look for the little details that can go better. I mean, for sure, this year so far, I think has been amazing. But um, yeah, I will never be uh, satisfied uh, at the end of the day. Max, Tom, and I were talking about Marco van Basten retiring from football at 28. And I always hear people talk about you. They say things like, he's going to get bored. He's going to get bored by this or potentially step away. Do the records that Schumacher set, are they worth sticking around for you, Max? Is that something that drives you? Um, like, I never really um, targeted, like, records. Um, I, of course, really enjoy what I'm doing now. And I think for me at the moment, is the opposite. This, for me, is not boring. This is really exciting. Like, I'm always very mm. motivated to get to the track. I think it's more when uh, you're not winning anymore and there is also no real plan in place or a future where you see yourself winning again, then probably you, you get bored. Yeah. But uh, I think retiring at 28 for me uh, is probably a bit too soon. Max, John Farrow is steeped in all that you do. He grew up in England and lives Formula One. I'm your ugly American. I'm new to this. I'm the one you need at Las Vegas, you need at Austin, Miami, wherever. And in reading about this, and I go to the great journalist Peter Windsor on this, he says you do corners and turns like nobody. He talks of Silverstone and the three turns of maggots and beckets. How do you approach the tight turns of Formula One? Peter Windsor says that's the difference. Um, I think... You know, everyone has their own driving style, but also I think what is key in our sport is that you're able to adapt to whatever is needed. So, you know, every year we have a new car, a different looking car, and every single car drives a bit differently. And I think, um, yeah, you always have to adapt and learn and try to grow, try to be different, try to really you know, get the most out of the car. And if the car is driven the fastest way in, in a different way than what you're used to, you have to try and um, adjust to that. Do you wish for a smaller, lighter car? Uh, of course, that would be ideal, but you also have to be realistic. I think with the safety standards that are, you know, always improving every single year, that is not always possible to go lighter. But I'm, I'm sure, you know, we are looking into uh, the future regulations as well to try and um, yeah, make it better. And Max, make your bosses lighter. are thinking about the commercial stuff. We caught up with Christian Horner. It's great to talk to Christian a month or so ago. And we were talking about the race calendar and how many races are now in new places like in the United States, like in Vegas. For a man like yourself, can you compare, say, a Monza to a Miami, a Las Vegas? And Max, do you get excited about it when, for some people, the purists might complain about this just being a commercial event, moving away from the traditional race car racing in places like Monza and Silverstone? Well, the, the beautiful thing is, is that we have a lot of different Grand Prix still. And um, I think it would be very boring if they're all the same, right? And yes, I am very aware that, you know, um, we shouldn't go to all the, let's say, the commercial places. But I think also Las Vegas gives you a new, a unique opportunity. And then time will tell, you know, if it's the right way to go or not. But for sure, from my side, you know, I'm, I like the pure racetracks i think an f1 car as well it really comes alive on on the proper racetracks like monza like spa like silverstone so for sure you know we need to keep these um kind of tracks on on the on the calendar max they're always trying to rework the format when a car a team goes through a period of dominance i remember when it just used to be qualifying 30 minutes fastest driver fastest car they get pole then they tried to make qualifying more interesting do you think tweaking the format with sprint racing in one weekend, not the other. Is that something that frustrates you as a driver? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really excited by these things because I think when something works really well, why do you need to try and mm -hmm. uh, tweak it? Um, and uh, yeah, this is, I think, a constant discussion. And uh, for sure, yeah. you know, some things will work out well, some don't. But uh, yeah, for me, trying to keep it like it is, you know, um, probably is the best thing forward because I always thought the qualifying format and, uh, you know, before you get into the, the single right. race, I think is very exciting. Max, I agree with you. I'm a complete hack at this, but I totally agree with you. The sprint thing is ridiculous. I just don't understand it. I love the qualification thing the day before. I love to tune into that. Max Verstappen, are you in a place is completely dominant in the sports involving all the money and the egos where can you control the future of who your teammate is. I understand there's autosport gossip and all that, but are you in a position now, Max, where you can dictate, discuss, or say who a future teammate will be? 
Well, this is always up to uh, the bosses and the team. I mean, of course, I'm I'm a team member now for a long time. And of course, things, you know, you talk about stuff, but I'm not the one who is telling them what to do or, or deciding things at the end of the day. I need to focus on my job and that's to try and drive as quick as I can every single weekend. We do a good job of that, Max. A good job of that, <laughs> particularly this season. <laughs> Max, how close are you with Checo? Yeah, we are very close. Honestly, I think... Um, we are very similar in a way also how we approach, I think, our life outside of Formula One. And, um, you know, he's a real family person. Of course, he has his kids as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty similar. I think it's good to to try and, you know, sometimes switch off and just, you know, not think about Formula One. And I think that's where we can really relate. You know what people are like? They like to stir up gossip and tell stories. And, Max, you've been reluctant to get involved in the Netflix series, which has been massive here stateside. Max, what's behind that reluctance? Why don't you like doing those things so much? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think at one point, you know, certain things are also a bit more private. Privacy uh, for me is very important. And, um, you know, I like things to be portrayed um, like they actually are, not with a lot of, um, let's say, spice to it. Um, but, you know, every year now, I mean, we had a good chat every year. I do, I do have an interview and I explain my side of the story. And I think that's important. Yeah. I know how important Netflix is in a way, of course, to try and attract um new fans but of course yeah it's important also to to really see the reality of of the sport john i'll let you ask i mean we're in london we come back and that gives us just enough time to go to las vegas oh, in november vegas. but you know if max can pull some strings for us i think possibly <laughs> we could be all las vegas with red bull you want to ask him yourself or you want no me no to i'd ask? let you ask please i think maybe gracious. max would prefer us to ask christian horner and we'll ask Christian a little bit later. Max, I wanted to squeeze this in. I wanted your side of the story. I don't want to talk about the last race. I want to go back to Austria. Final lap of the Grand Prix. You have the opportunity to set the fastest lap. You make the call to make a pit, to put on fresh tyres and go around and set the fastest lap for a single point, Max. From your perspective, walk me through the thinking there. Is that something you've planned ahead of the race? Is that something you think about in the moment? And where does that confidence, that conviction come from? to go against the team who would like you to stay out and just make the call yourself. I can do it. I know I can do it. I've got the control, the ability to perform. Where does that come from, Max? Yeah, I mean, I always try to maximize everything I can. And, um, you know, I saw the opportunity for the extra points. So I was like, well, why not? Of course, there's always a bit of a risk um, with these kind of things. But at the other hand, no risk, no fun, right? So that's um, what was also going through my, uh, my head at the time. Max, good luck for race weekend. You and the team, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Max Verstappen of Red Bull Racing. TK, just one of the best right now. Absolutely dominant. What were you doing at 25? <laughs> that's, uh, not that. That's, not that. The, I, I look at this, folks, and I really urge all of you, particularly in America, where this is all new to us, go to Wikipedia. It's a lengthy Wikipedia. And just see how this kid, as you mentioned, John, his father was the real deal. Formula One, his mother was involved in the sport. He straddled the Netherlands and Belgium uh, in a, a divorce. And he just worked at it from day one, seven, eight years old. And you walk right through the triumph and some of the adversity along the way. He was karting with Charles Leclerc as a kid. Some fantastic pictures of that. Who's with Ferrari right that. now. They've been around each other for years. There's some fantastic pictures of him with his father, Tom. Well, and, and as well <clears throat> with Michael Schumacher as well. One of, if not the best drivers to ever do it. And, and his father's one. there in the pit. Like when they win, he's over, you know, greeting his father as he greets the teammates as well. What I love about it is third place every single race is somebody new like Pierre Gasly sure. last week. That's Tom, great. to that point, I think some people get bored of dominance sometimes. I don't. I admire it. Yeah. I want to understand what's behind it. We saw it with Hamilton and Mercedes. We saw it with Schumacher and Ferrari. And right now, I think we're seeing it on a completely different level with Red Bull yeah. and Max Verstappen. And talks to Red Bull and thanks to our team for putting this together with Mr. Horner. More Formula One still to come, of course, through the race season. And hopefully we'll end up at Vegas if Horner November follows 21, through. If you're just tuning in, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 right now, positive by zero. 0.2%. Coming up, 8.30 Eastern Time, Andrew Hollenhorst, the City, on their call for one more move from this Federal Reserve, Tom, before year-end, and maybe the best guest of the hour, Cameron Dawson. Cameron, Cameron, Cameron around the table with his Cameron, Cameron heard you last Dawson. hour. And I said, is it, is it Andrew or is it Max? And were she's you, like, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> were, were, you at Miami? Were, you, were you at Miami? No. With Formula One? No. I can just see you down there. I mean, you see Cameron down here. Miami, Vegas. I don't like the new race calendar. I don't. I'm just going to put I, I that out there. 
I, I do not like it because to me these courses are radically different. It's not like you know Fenway Park versus Yankee Stadium. They're radically different. I loved at Zandvoort the up and down. That was cool. We don't yeah. see the elevation thing. That, yeah, you don't have that at Miami. It looks like a boulevard. I get that the owners of Formula One want to make it a circus. It's about providing content. I understand all the financial reasons for that. But if you're a racing purist, if Watkins, you just want to see oh, people on. like Max go around classic tracks like Silverstone, like Monza and elsewhere, Tom, that's the part of the race calendar that I love. Well, like Watkins Glen in my ute up in you know upstate New York, there was Watkins Glen, which is sort of... Just like, like Monza. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah. Sort of like Just like it. Did I do okay there? That was wonderful. I was up all night. I pulled an all nighter to get ready. For Equities <laughs> on the S&P 500. Slightly positive. 16 minutes away. Jobless claims in America. Then on to payrolls tomorrow. The data so far making progress in a way that maybe the Fed would like to see. Equities up. Yields lower. We're down two basis points from New York. Good morning. The 10-year Treasury, in my mind, is a screaming buy. I think that we do get 10-year yields back to 3%. I don't think it happens this year. I think that that will be a first half of 2024 event. I do think that there is a significant mismatch between the primary buyers of Treasuries and the incremental players. How do we go back to talking about treasuries after that? But apparently we have to. Because Max Lingen. needs some ladder treasuries. And the US rate strategy at <laughs> FEMO Capital Markets. We almost asked him about the treasury market. I just hate that stuff. Max Verstappen, I hate that stuff. are you taking advantage of tax-free bonds? <laughs> what do you think of the two-year right now at 5%? Let's turn to that bond market and have a look, a sneak peek of what's developing going into jobless claims about 13 minutes from now. Yields are a little bit lower, down two basis points of 4.86 on a 10-year 4.09%. That's a big change in the last week. In the equity market, slightly elevated positive after a four-day winning streak, attempting to make it five, up a third of 1%. And Kaylee, headline after headline from China yeah. in the last hour. Yes, indeed. Now, we already knew that this might happen, but now confirmation. China has approved a rate cut on existing mortgages for first homes. In addition to that, the PBOC lowering down payments for first and second home, second time home buyers, really trying to stoke the property market, which we know is struggling to a very large degree. Country Garden, just one example of that. But then you also had headlines earlier today, raising tax breaks for childcare. Can, it's just one thing after another. Can I ask the surveillance dumb question of the day? Doesn't the government, particularly given a totalitarian regime with unique control, just step in and bail them out? The property sector? Yeah. If you listen to our team at Bloomberg Economics, yeah. it's too big it's to too bail It's too big. Out. I don't buy it. I, you know, they're China. They're huge. You know, what are they? they, they I will tell you off the back the of this, we do have an FX move. If you bring up dollar CNH, got a stronger Chinese currency yeah. off the back of some of these measures. So slowly, 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 it's just starting to pile up, Tom. Is it going to make a difference? TK, to <clears> your <throat> point, is it about ability or willingness? They have the ability. Willingness, absolutely. About willingness. 100%. And Jay Pulaski was brilliant on this one. He wasn't talking about Duke football. Kaylee almost walked off the set. He emailed me set. about that. <laughs> Kaylee ago. almost yeah. walked off the set. I mean, you know, it was painful. <laughs> what a day it has been. We're going to migrate to this, and she has been more than patient. Cameron Dawson joining us, CIO at Red Bull Formula One Racing, <laughs> joins us this morning. Thank you so much for your patience with Max Verstappen. Greatly appreciate it. Um, you've got one single sentence, and you, you go right to the heart of it. September is the worst month, and yet you're hardwired, optimistic. you got to be in the market. Do you go to cash in September? No, because September being the worst month is just because it's below average returns. It's not necessarily that it's all going to implode. And even the correction that we had in August was below average, meaning it was so small in its magnitude. So it doesn't really warrant making big portfolio changes. I think at the end of the day, this correction has not been about growth. And in fact, we've actually seen EPS growth estimates going up in recent weeks. And I think that's one of the reasons for these shorter, shallow corrections. It's when the revisions cycle turns down, that you should be more concerned of a deeper correction. Ian Lingen, BMO, moments ago, we just played the clip. He said, mm. screaming buy, 10-year. Yeah. It's actually my words that I put in his mouth, but <laughs> he agreed with it. Do you agree it's a screaming buy? 
Well, if the 10 years is screaming buy, then credit is a screaming sell and equities, at least the riskiest parts of equities would be a screaming sell. Because we think that for the 10 year to go back to 3%, you would actually have to see much weaker economic environment. You'd need to see the whites of the eyes of a recession. And that likely means Ooh. then that those economic or those earning projections for 2024, which have about low double digit growth, are white, way too high. So if the 10 year goes back to 3%, we think it would be bad for risk assets. Do you see that recession? Not the whites of the eyes? No, not yet. Though, you know, there's all this discussion about GDP versus GDI and if GDP will catch down and really what is the underlying growth rate. But for right now, we don't see enough evidence that a recession is imminent. And there still are calls that will enter one in the fourth quarter. We think if we do have one, it's much more of a 2024 scenario, which just means that it's not being priced in yet. If we don't have one, though, couldn't that also be bad news? If the landing is too soft, couldn't that mean the Fed has to has to do more and then eventually has to force it anyway. Yeah, it is very peculiar because that is actually what's happened in 2023. The Fed has had to do more than what was projected. Yeah. The bond market has had to price in more hikes, less cuts. You've seen yields go up. Yields since or the pricing of the <clears throat> December 2023 Fed rate has gone up 170 basis points since the March low. <laughs> since that time, mm -hmm. the Nasdaq PE multiple is up 36%. So I don't know going right. forward if the path of the Fed matters as much for equity valuations mm -hmm. as it did, let's say, in 21 or 22. We talked a few days ago about the cost of real estate, renting, mm -hmm. the struggle for a huge body of America to mm -hmm. find a down payment for real estate. We got a huge response on that discussion. Mm -hmm. Do you advocate margin here? within this bull market? This question doesn't come up enough, I think. Everybody's out there selling the idea of leverage up margin, options margin, futures margin, margin, margin. Do you advocate using margin within the growth sphere? Well, margin is a heck of a lot more expensive than it was just a few years ago, given rates are higher. So you have to factor that into the equation. We have seen, you can see measures in FINRA data about the usage of margin debt, and that's come off of the 2020 wind peaks, which is not surprising. But the real question is how much of that is being replaced by options, which are a form of margin. Four to one, yeah, roughly. And so you've yeah. seen so much option activity, surging call options, the zero date to expiration options. So margin is always is something that you have to play with very, very carefully because it, of course, can work against you very quickly. She memorized Sometimes that can go counsel. back. <laughs> she just, Cameron just nailed that. Can answer. we talk about a different kind of margin? Profit margins <clears throat> mm -hmm. at Dollar General. They've come out and basically said earnings are going to tumble as much as 34% on a per share basis during the current fiscal year. It's pretty brutal stuff. They're not alone. Are you taking what the retailers are saying seriously? Is this more important than what the hard data is telling us right now, which is retail consumption is better than good? Well, there's some retailers that have pricing power and some that don't. And I think that Dollar General probably falls into that category where the elasticity of the demand of their customers mm -hmm. is much different than the higher end retail where they can continue to push price. They can continue to pass on those higher costs to their customers. So the areas where you don't have pricing power is where you're seeing the margin pressure. Yeah. And of course, when we're talking about the different areas within discretionary and pricing power, travel airlines. They've been able to exercise pa pricing power in such a material way as we've seen demand recover out of the pandemic. And John, you earlier this week pointed to when we got the consumer confidence data, which was weaker, people were still willing to travel. Planning vacations. Put it on their credit card. Now, I don't know whether to believe that data or not. Yeah. I'm wondering whether they just saw Instagram posts and were like, I'm planning one too. Right. Like, I wonder how that data is put together. Are we going to see that vacation boom continue? Yeah, the FOMO is real. And there's all this talk about all of the summer that we've had with the concerts, the hot girl summer, if that's coming <laughs> to an end. I, I think at the end of the day, the question going forward is, can the consumer yeah. continue to live beyond means? We've seen credit usage go up, but it's yeah. that savings rate that's coming down and the savings balance that has been whittled down. Did you see how it chilled? just came into our, our offices here at 731. I saw Holland Horse walk by. Andrew's and it's in. like the black cloud of high interest rates. I can never like see because chill, the, light, the lights aren't chill, on in the corner of the studio, so I can never see. The, the room when Holland Horse shows up. If we get an Andrew Holland Horse world of higher interest rates, what does that do to your stock portfolio? Well, I think it does increasingly create a challenge, but as we just 
just talked about is that we have seen this divergence of yields and growth valuations, for example. In the past, we would say that if yields continue to climb higher, we should be concerned that growth valuations trading up near 2021 highs would not be sustainable. Now, if yields are higher because growth is better, inflation's higher, that is good for the earnings side of the scenario, but then you get that offset from valuation. The Eras Tour has been the most meaningful electric experience of my life so far. And I'm overjoyed to tell you that it'll be coming to the big screen soon, starting October 13th. You'll be able to experience the concert film in theatres, Tom, in North America. Do you like that? This is Taylor Swift speaking, not John do I need a t- <laughs> Definitely, definitely do not me. A, that is a direct Do quote. I need a friendship bracelet? What's a friendship bracelet? Isn't that bracelet something you tie up and hand to a friend? Have you seen this, yes. Cameron? Have you seen Miss Swift? You to buy them on beaches, No, no, I'm, I, you can't. no, I have We're not. looking at Paris tickets. Paris tickets in May of next year. A decent seat's 900 bucks, and somewhere back near Lyon is $700. <laughs> it's you know. a bargain. Cameron, thank you. Cameron Dawson of New Edge. Does Coming up like- in the next hour on Bloomberg TV, Daryl Cronk of Wells Fargo, the Chief Investment <laughs> Officer. We'll catch up with Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management, Jack Caffrey of J.P. Morgan. If she pays that much to the IRS, do we get to pay less taxes? <laughs> I guess. If only it worked that way, TK. <clears throat> it did. If only it did. Maybe that's a good idea for I'm the campaign next year. I'm watching the video year. here. It, Coming video to theaters. Is it? Okay. It's, she's doing Barbie, except it's not Barbie, it's Taylor. Get the, the popcorn Eras ready. tour goes to the movies. Mm. <laughs> Okay, from New York, (laughs) this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg surveillance on the break. Kaylee Lines trying to book Milan. Emirates Air, (laughs) nonstop Milan to go see Monza. Yep. You and Max. Totally. I mean, there it is. It's a big deal. Thank you to our team again for a conversation with Max Verstappen. We're trying to get back on keel here, and we can do this with Michael McKee because it's a raft, a Seattle slew of data uh, (laughs) today. Personal income and spending is what I'm looking at. Launching our data here. It's slow to come out on a pre Labor Day. Michael McKee is the wheels turn in Washington to tell us what's going on in America. Yeah, just barely getting some data. Here we go. Let's start with jobless claims since it's at the top of our list. 228,000. That's down from 230 the week before. That's the unrevised number. I'll see if I can get that for you. The revised number. Uh, continuing claims rise to 1,725,000 from 1702, which is not a big deal. Uh, it does still suggest that the labor market is fairly tight. We're not letting people go. Personal income up two tenths. That is less than the three tenths the prior month. And personal spending is up eight tenths, which is not only higher than it was last month in June, uh, five tenths. It is higher than the estimate of seven tenths. So you've got the folks at the Atlanta Fed and their GDP now (laughs) doing some quick recalculations. PCE's deflator. These are the Fed's favorite inflation numbers. At this point, uh, up two-tenths during the month of July. And so on a year-over-year basis, it's up 3.3%, which was exactly as forecast higher than the 3.0. This is uh, base effects that are happening. The fact, guys, that it is two-tenths is basically uh, what the Fed wants to see. We're not seeing an acceleration in inflation anymore. Same with the core, two-tenths. And it's up 4.2%, which is uh, also bang on expectations. Michael McKee, what else do you see here? I got the market lifting up here. I mean, it's been a four-day lift. I don't know if I can describe it. The data Dow futures up 195. The VIX comes in 13.75. What does this do to Atlanta GDP now? Are well, we going to get away from this 5 plus X near 6%? Well, not, not, with these, not with these numbers because the personal consumption numbers yeah. are higher. So uh, you would expect them to still be in the high five. Maybe it tips it over into six. I don't know what their weighting is for this. Uh, obviously, Everybody expects that to go down as the third quarter progresses because this is only the first month. The uh, revised uh, jobless claims for last week were 232 up from 230. This is the funny thing about jobless claims. It's like the training wheels of economic indicators, but you can never make a great prediction because they always revise the previous number, so you don't know what's going on. But what it does show you is that claims went down significantly from the prior week. Translate that. That means it's a better labor economy than the gloom that's out there right? Well, I don't know that there's any gloom out there. Everybody's still looking at a fairly tight labor market. We are seeing a deceleration in job creation as jobs get filled, but we're not seeing a rise in unemployment. 
<clears throat> Never a dull moment. Michael McKee here with a serious set of data today, including at 945, the Chicago PMI may be obscure, but he'll make it important. And then on to jobs tomorrow. That will be fascinating. We'll go beneath the headline data. Kaylee Lines will not be here. <laughs> Lisa Abramowitz will not be here. And Jonathan Farrow? Jonathan Farrow. He's on his way to Monza. He will not be here. I was thinking about asking for the day off. Crypto, <laughs> crypto job report. Let, John handle, let John, Tom handle it all himself. Well, that's what go. I thought. And they said, You're, you can't do that. So Kay Greifeld will show up and we'll have a crypto jobs day. There you oh, go. Okay. Looking forward to that. There we go. Yeah, Ms. Greifeld will be with us tomorrow. Right now, we're going to migrate to the conversation today on economics. No, it's not with the economists. Uh, Max Vandersteven. It's it's with Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup, who joins us right now. Hugely interesting and a lot of talk at Jackson Hole about the Hollenhorst conviction. I want to give you a little history on this. There is a character and culture to each school. And the character of culture of mid-20th century UCLA economics was one of courage. It was an entrenched faculty pushing against the freshwater economists pushing against those uh, liberals up in New England as they are. They were different out at UCLA. And there was a guy who died at 88 last year, Axel Leonavud, who was a hero in my house. And as someone once said to me, he was the Marine coming out of the trenches. Andrew Hollenhorst has been the Marine in this odd, odd Fed cycle. You have taken shrapnel for your high yield call. People are like, not. And yet you reaffirm the Fed higher this morning, don't you? I think if you just look at this economic the mic, data. Andrew, the mic's over here. Come on. All right. I, the, I, first I, <laughs> okay. the first time on the show. Yeah, thanks, Tom. <clears throat> if, if you look at the economic data, I mean, it just keeps coming in, showing a tight labor market. Uh, we keep getting these numbers, strong spending. I agree with Mike. I don't think we're going to get 5 6% GDP <clears throat> this quarter, but we're probably going to get at least 2% GDP and maybe 3% GDP growth. And I think you did hear some of that coming out of Jackson Hole. Uh, you look at the core inflation numbers. They've slowed for a couple months. That's good news. Headline inflation has slowed. So there, there is some good news in terms of price pressure that's a little bit more subdued now. Right. But when you look at this economy, the tight labor market, it's going to drive wages. Wages are going to drive prices. The heart of your academics, and frankly, it goes to Catherine Mann now at the Bank of England as well, is a real humility about what we don't know. Olivier Blanchard calls that other factors. What are the other factors that the low yield people, the rate cut people get wrong? Yeah, so I, I, I think the other factors that we have at play here in the U.S. economy include some of the domestic strength that I was talking about, which is not just the <clears throat> tight labor market, but also the tight housing market. Mm -hmm. And this is an odd one, and I, I think you described this cycle as being odd, and, and it certainly is. Usually you would think mortgage rates move higher, we get a slowdown in housing, and we get a slowdown in house prices. And that happened, but the issue we have now is supply has actually become more constrained in the housing sector than demand. So those households that have an existing home that are paying a 3% mortgage rate, not a lot of incentive to put that home on the market. So that supply is staying really constrained. The Case-Shiller price index came out this week. Um, we're up again close to double-digit percentage increases on an annualized basis, and that's just not going to be consistent with 2% inflation. Yeah, there's just no inventory in the existing home market. It all is in the new market, which is why you're seeing that bifurcation in housing. Just on the subject of demand outside of housing and coming back to the data of this morning with personal spending of eight tenths of one percent at the same time that personal income actually grew less than expected. How much longer realistically could the U.S. consumer live above their means if we're talking about a savings pile that has dwindled, which is what was helping fuel this in the first place, and your income not growing as fast, wages barely keeping up with inflation? Isn't the spending going to have to come to a halt at some point? Yeah, and don't forget student loan repayments restarting. Yeah, in so, October. Yeah, so there, there are some headwinds that the consumer is facing here. Um, I think what, what has happened, though, is we had such an extended period of low interest rates, such an extended period of ample liquidity. Um, you saw credit card debt go down significantly during the pandemic. And now those levels have built back up. Now you're seeing delinquency rates that are getting back to more normal delinquency rates that we would expect in kind of a normally functioning economy. To your point, as the Fed leaves rates higher, we're going to see more tightening of credit. That's going to be a headwind for consumers. Eventually, that will slow the economy. Um, we still think we could see a significant economic slowdown in 2024, perhaps a recession in 2024. Um, but you, know, you have to take seriously the data um, that are coming in, and we still see this this really strong spending, like you pointed out, you know, eight tenths of a percentage point up 
uh, on personal spending. I mean, it's just a really strong consumer right now. So if we do get that recession in 2024, but you still don't get 2% inflation, is the Federal Reserve going to tolerate the pain ultimately, do you think? So that's a really tough scenario for the Fed. I think if you get a significant enough slowdown, you will see some deflationary pressure. Um, but we could have a period of time, and maybe it's going to be an extended period of time, where you see the economy slowing. Um, and to some extent, you, you see this with the you know, credit that is tightening already. Right? We have some signs that things are going to slow down eventually. Um, if inflation was stably at 2%, then the Fed might be a lot more comfortable thinking about cutting rates. I think what we heard from Chair Powell last week at Jackson Hole was that although they'll be attentive to both growth and inflation, uh, right now they really do have to concentrate on those upside risks to inflation. That's where you're coming from. We still have various measures of core underlying inflation that are running too high. Um, and that means that there could be a period of time when you see mm. somewhat weaker growth data, but the Fed is still holding rates higher. Richard Clarida is identified with this thing, DSGE. All you need to know on a Labor Day Thursday is we're not going to do the math. either. I can't do the math. It's that fancy. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I mentioned Axel Leonovit earlier, that article from years ago, Beyond DSG Models, where he and a team really go after the math, the math certitude, the mathiness of the Andrew Hollenhorst world. Do we have operative models right now? Do we, in God's name, know what we're doing? So I think that is one of the big challenges here. Um, what is the theoretical framework that we're using to assess the economy and to assess monetary policy? And you heard Powell point to that uncertainty in his comments. As last a non-economist, I as a non-economist, yeah. yeah. And so he you know, he talked about this you know, navigating according to the stars under a cloudy sky. And what does he mean by the stars? The the underlying neutral rate of interest uh, that would neither be restrictive nor stimulative. Uh, the underlying natural rate of unemployment. The, these are important theoretical concepts, but we really don't have a good way of evaluating them in real time. We don't know where they are. So it is going to be this kind of responding to the data. It just comes back to data dependency. If you don't have a strong theoretical framework, then you follow the data. Yeah, setting monetary policy can be a tricky business in an environment like this one. Can I just quickly ask you about fiscal policy as well? Because we hear a lot about, we have not yet seen things like the CHIPS Act, Inflation Reduction Act, that actually being realized in the economy and making a difference. At what point does what theoretically could be a driver actually become a drag because the Fed might have to respond to those new injections? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's a great point. We're starting to see some things in the data that are at least suggestive that maybe you're seeing some of this showing up. Um, we did see stronger investment in manufacturing. Maybe that's related to the CHIPS Act. Um, but you're right. These things are going to take a long time to actually play out. It's going to take time for that money to come into the economy. Um, at the end of the day, the Fed is not going to kind of look at fiscal policy and then try to directly offset fiscal policy with monetary yeah, policy. It's not their business. Right? It, exactly. The Fed doesn't want to be in that business. So what the Fed is going to do is just look at the data, look at the data like we got today. If inflation stays cooler, then that's great news. And that's more reason to think that the Fed can be a little bit more dovish here. I, I think they're pretty comfortable with the level of policy rates. Um, we still think they're probably going to hike one more time in November, but that's probably going to be the end of the cycle. And then it really comes back to this question of when do they make that first cut? Mm. Andrew Hollenhorst with us, and we will uh, continue. We need to do some data check here off the Michael McKee data, as they say. Uh, futures up 10. Dow futures up a nice half a percent, 164 points. NASDAQ less so. The VIX under 14 to me is a huge deal, 13.79. I should also point out, Kaylee, help me here, oil with a climb. And I'm going to say it's a $6 climb that yeah. we've had. We're pushing near $87 print. Yeah, and 82 on WTI. And what was it that Chris Verone told us earlier this week? He could see 90 on yeah. Brent. Some of those upward yeah. pressures on price of energy. I have a question of the, how that transmits to I haven't else. looked at the chart, but it's in place as well. I've got some dollar strength here, I guess, off the McKee jumble here. Mike McKee digging into the data. We'll get to that here in the coming hours with Mr. McKee. On the Standard & Poor's 500, we are up two-tenths of a percent. We say good morning with us, Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup. I want to talk about the cardinal belief here, Andrew, where there's a lot of people that remember this yield structure pre-07, and it's all new to people out 15, 16 years. Respond to a Citigroup uh, client saying to you, OMG, we're all going to die because of high yield. And yet we've lived with high yield before, haven't we? 
Yeah, I think if you look at the period, you know, roughly 2005 through 2007, um, it was a strong economy. It was an economy that was producing 4%, 5% nominal GDP growth, um, you know, roughly 2% real GDP growth and to around 2% inflation. Um, and that was an economy that performed that way with 10-year yields around the levels where they are now. So I, I do think that you have to take a long enough historical lens when you look at this, a long enough historical window. Yes, if you just compare to the post-2000, 2008 period, 10-year yields look quite high, yeah. and 10-year real yields really look quite high, right? We're getting close to 2% 10-year real yield. Um, but if you look back to that period, which you could argue was in some ways a more normal period, we had kind of a lot of strange things that happened after the financial crisis in the economy, um, a period when the economy was really digging its way out mm -hmm. um, from that deep hole that it got into. Um, you know, it's not to say that that Tenure yields will stay at this level forever, but I, I think that period, right. you know, that, that, that kind of shows you that you can be there. I don't want to put you on the spot. Ten seconds. What does the Fed do in September? September, they pause. I think they right. pause, but they keep the dot showing one more hike. See how he does that? He's just a complete victim of the parlor game. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Powers, thank you so much. He is thank a city you. group and has been definitive with a select group of others, Bill Dudley and others, on the nation needing a higher interest rate structure. Coming up, anticipated, not Max Vanderstoppen, the Max Vanderstoppen of technology, Dan Ives joins us. <laughs> Bloomberg surveillance, Dan Ives has walked into the room. We had a color correction. We'll get to that in uh, a moment. Uh, futures up eight, we can advance fourth, fifth, sixth day in a row. It's bull market. Futures up eight, you see that with the VIX. 31 in October. Good morning, Ralph Ancampora, giant of technical analysis. Good morning, Dr. Yardeni, giant of Yale. And uh, years past, C.J. Lawrence, we're going to go higher from October, they said. The VIX was 31. It's now 13. <laughs> this gets your attention as well. Due to the importance of our guests, the Max Verstappen of technology, We'll get the movers out of the way to get to Mr. I. Yeah, I'll do it very quickly. Please. Starting with Salesforce, up 6.5% <clears throat> in pre-market trading at the moment. Wow. Revenue and profit forecast, top estimates. They're getting some progress in that campaign to cut costs, some cooling concerns around a sales slowdown as well. So that stock getting a nice reward. But Dollar General, Tom, getting hammered in pre-market trading, down 17% after cutting its outlook again. They say earnings will tumble as much as 34% on a per share basis, basis during the current fiscal year. So pretty brutal for that low cost retailer. And then finally, AMC. Tom Taylor Swift is coming to the movies, the Eras Tour in North America, October 13th. And AMC is promising that they will play that at every one of its U.S. locations at least four times a day. Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. That stock up 6.7%. I go to where Paul Sweeney is on this, and off of Barbie and Oppenheimer changed behavior. Oppenheimer doing 700 million. Uh, I talked to Paul yesterday. He said he's not sure it could get to a billion. Let's do a movie on a theoretical physics guy from 1949. <laughs> That'll work. Let's At the same time as like that. Yeah. But Taylor's like a shoe in, right? Oh, you know, for sure. It's like a huge deal. Taylor, Barbie, Beyonce. It's a cultural moment. Tom. It's a cultural moment. It's a cultural moment when Dan Ives walks in the door. We're going to do that. And today we're going to do something different. Really drill down and focus on Apple. We do this. And when I look at Mac rumors, which is like, you know, all the gossip about there. And of course, we're advantaged by the wonderful work of Mark Garman. Rumored features 6.1 and 6.7 inch sizes, dynamic island for all models, periscope zoom lens for pro models. USB-C port, lose it, dumb idea, Tim. <laughs> Qualcomm modem chip. It's not just another phone, is it, Dan? It's not. And I think it speaks to what I is going to be a mini super cycle playing out for Apple. You know, I think it's been one of the things that you've seen investors, I think, have underestimated this upgrade cycle. I mean, we believe $240 million of $1.2 billion have not upgraded their phones in four plus years. <clears throat> What's your terminal timeline when you analyze this financially. I'm enjoying a 30 multiple on Apple now. I've got low single digit uh, revenue growth. The world's coming to it. And yes, service is doing better and all that. How far out do you have to go to justify the marginal share purchase? 
I think you have to go out two to three years, in my opinion, because what's really happening here is you're actually seeing a renaissance of growth on iPhone, especially when you think about constant currency. You look at services in terms of what's happening there, now double-digit growth. Look, Tom, I think some of the parts, we're looking at a three and a half to four trillion dollar mark cap in the next 12 to 18 months. And I think it just speaks to our view where this is for Apple, they continue to play chess, others play checkers. What about China as a factor in this story? Talk about playing a game here, Huawei introducing a smartphone, Chinese state media talking it up as just being in a competition between the US and China mm. in terms of this tech. How real is that threat, especially for the Chinese consumer, which Apple does rely on. Yeah, look, if you look in China, I mean, Cook and Cupertino, they've gained 300 bips of market share in China. That's the irony is that right now, despite the worries about China, that's actually been the core hearts and lungs of the success story. And I think when, when it comes to the actual upgrade cycle that we see with iPhone 15, I actually think China is going to be a tailwind. And I think it just comes down right now. It's, it's Apple's world. Everyone else is paying rent. <laughs> I believe that they will regain more and more share in smartphone. I think, look, Samsung continues to be an ever like uphill battle. Okay, that's in smartphones. What about in everything else? Got a lot of products here in the Apple ecosystem. And our Mark Gurman, to your point, always breaks news on Apple, Tom. They're testing 3D printers to mm -hmm. make the stainless steel watch. Well, I think that, look, I mean, and, and Gurman knows Apple as well as anyone. I think the big thing here is going to be what I believe is is the grand slam, is, is the AI mm. app store that Apple, we okay. believe, will introduce in 2025. I got eight questions. Let's go there quickly. AI, they don't have a plan. Baloney. Cupertino has a plan. What's their AI application of NVIDIA's wonderment? Look, it comes down to right now, it all starts with developers building more and more apps that I believe are going to be ultimately Apple specific. And I think it starts with what we see right now that, mm -hmm. that ultimately is going to be more of a monetization on services. I believe, look, I think- You think AI is going to go over to the service sector? I think AI could add right. 30 to $40 per share to Apple stock, which is why, as Tom's talking about, I think right now, anyone that right. thinks that Cook doesn't have an AI strategy, I mean, that's like okay. saying Steph think doesn't again. have a Just because of time. I got CapEx. I got all this growthiness in Apple, blah, blah, blah. But I got CapEx, which is basically flat pre-pandemic. I did $10 billion large- CapEx pre-pandemic. I'm only doing 11, 12 billion more out 2024. How are they generating their growthiness without a buildup in CapEx? It's because of the install base, because you have the the golden install base of Cupertino that continues to be underestimated by the street. And I think that's, <clears throat> now I do believe CapEx is going to ramp up right. over the next two, three years between what I view as the AI app store as well as what the Apple car 2026. I, I want to talk about the hope and prayer, which is forget about this $1,000 thing. You do a monthly plan and you do it through a phone provider. <laughs> Last time around, T-Mobile and the rest of them stepped up big. Yep. Have a free iPhone. Are they going to do it again? Are they going to step up even more this even time? Even more this time? E Discuss it. That's time. important. Because I think the carrier discounts that you're going to see are going to be jaw-dropping. I think there's a recognition about that install base. They know the numbers. They know that um, there's a massive opportunity to put an iron fence this around This is it. critical. You think T-Mobile is going to reaffirm Magenta with the new iPhone? Oh, I think it's not just T-Mobile. I think when you look at Verizon, AT&T, and the types of carrier discounts we see here, it speaks to why, even though I believe it's $150 to $200 price increase that we're going to see, this is something where it's going to be a massive cycle for Apple. And I think that's why even our, out of our Asia checks, you've seen what I view as not just flat, to an uptick year over year for iPhone 14, despite many bears saying, you know, that the, the world's coming to an end. There's a lot of stocks in your coverage, Dan. Is Apple your favorite for all these reasons that you're outlining? Look, Apple continues to be a table pounder. Microsoft as a cloud table pounder. Of course, Tesla is our EV play. Look, I view it, in my opinion, the new tech bull market is here. And I think, and I think this is just really the start of the next 18, 24 month bull cycle. And you think that lasts, even if we have higher for longer rates from the Federal Reserve. Is that not really relevant to these names? Look, I think it comes down to, we believe Fed cuts 
at one point next year. Mm -hmm. And it just comes down to the growth. It's a 1995-like cycle in terms of AI. The bears will come out of hibernation mode. They've called 10 of the last two downturns. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I look here, and I look pre-Labor Day, and I'm just so thrilled you came in understated. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're trying to do a serious financial show here. You got the famous the eyed sneaks. shoes, and now you matched them. You got so many endorsements going on in your look, I can't keep up. Look, because I'm in the presence of, of Keen, of course, I had to dress a little understated. Yeah, But I notched it down a little. What the, the how do they audience. greet you at Cupertino? You walk in looking like a frosted lemon at Cupertino. <laughs> how, do, how do they respond? When you come in Cupertino, it's really they're like, okay, right. could, could this potentially be some sort of AI right. you know, strategy. Uh -huh. What's a chip surprise, P iPad, computer, phone at the stupid, silly Cupertino rollout in September? September What's the 12th in terms of drum. I think the surprise is going to be the chip rollout. I agree. And I think the biggest surprise is going to be AI functionality that we... we They're going to outline their AI strategy. I believe strategy. they will discuss AI <clears throat> strategy despite having no strategy according to many of the bears. Dan Ives, thank you so much. Thank we got you. through that meta-free. See how we did we that? We did indeed. Can I just, yeah. for the radio audience Please. who can't see Dan Ives, yellow pants, light green jacket, kind of a tie-dye situation shirt. No, it's really like Chagall. Cool it's Nike much sneakers. more of a Tuileries Paris kind of look. You know, he's okay. going like Saint-Tropez. It's just like the last day of August, little it's, last taste of it's summer It's somewhere between a Saint-Tropez, a Swift concert, it's a combo. I'm yeah. dressed like a funeral it's except a for my UVA tie. Yeah, it's <laughs> Dan Ives, thank you. Thank you. So much. With Wedbush. And, and taken seriously, even the people, he's a pinata on the street because he's been so right. And uh, I must say that he takes it with grace as well. We need to say thank you, Kaylee, Lisa, John, I'm abandoned <laughs> for tomorrow. There will be a jobs report tomorrow. Michael McKee and uh, Ms. Greifeld will be with us here. It'll be a most interesting day. We leave it. Futures up nine. Stay with us through the day on television and radio before Verstappen at Monza. <laughs>